like to call to order the budget work session. This is our second work session, Tuesday, March 8th, and the time is 6.40. Could we please stand for the Pledge of Allegiance? Thank you. Well, we were enlightened with lots of valuable information last night, and here we are together again. <clears throat> Tonight's agenda brings us the Recreation Department, Peacedale Office Building, the Neighborhood Guild, and Senior Services, um, and then on to Public Works Administration, to the Wastewater Transfer, uh, water, waste water, and solid waste. So at this time, I'd like to turn it over to Mr. Alfred. Thank you. Thank you. Tonight we're going to uh, start on page N34 for the Recreation Department. So it'll be N34 in the narrative and page 20 on the uh, GF pages, on the, uh, the actual detail. So if you get to uh, uh, GF20, that'll give you the, uh, the line item detail and the narrative will give you the uh, performance standards for this department. Uh, what I've placed on the board is a summary of the recreation uh, programs in the uh, town general fund, and we'll go through those first, and then we'll go on to PDOB and Guild and seniors. <clears throat> the, uh, okay, uh, GF20. GF20 and N34. And if you get bingo within the first five minutes, we're all set, Jim. <laughs> the uh, Recreation Department budget is presented in uh, several components. One is the administration, second, maintenance, uh, athletics, uh, aquatic program, leisure services, uh, creative activities. We also include with that the contribution to the parades under celebration. Uh, I'm going to ask uh, Terry to uh, walk you through the, uh, the program, uh, but before she does, I'll indicate that the overall increase uh, for the program is about $23,000. Overall program is about $1,340,000 in overall cost. Revenues that are generated within the recreation program to pay for a portion of that $1.34 million amount to about 612000 The overall property tax support for the recreation program next year will be $727,807, which is about a $4,000 increase over the current year. So with that, in terms of background, I'll turn it over to Terry for, uh, uh, for some comments. Thank you, Steve. <clears throat> Thank you to the Town Council for having me this evening to review the budgets. Um, at this time, what I'd like to do is just start with um, the administration for the Recreation Department budget. Um, that's Cost Center 1110. And essentially, this is the uh, funding for the overall administration of the department. Um, it reflects a $5,698 increase over the previous year, um, which is mainly attributed to personnel increases. We have seen an increase in uh, overtime line by $1,200, which covers uh, typically guild staffing, our reception positions, as well as administrative support um, in terms of customer service. We at times will have an overlap at five o'clock in the evening. It becomes very busy. We have usually have one person assigned to the front desk, but at that time we, we sometimes have the need to have two people staffed there. So we've um, accounted for some overtime funding. You'll also notice that in the printing and binding um, line item, we've had a decrease of about $2,600. Um, last year we actually bid out the brochure that is sent out three times a year and um, revise the specifications so that uh, we're able to realize a decrease um, in that expense. 
You'll also notice that under professional services, we have a $4,700 increase. Um, the department plans to go, uh, go, the department plans to establish a new data management system, including online registration capabilities in the coming year, and that $4,700 will be allocated towards that uh, data management system. It will be shared, the cost, total cost will be shared with, uh, with the guild budget as well. We're hoping that that um, streamlines our registration processes and really makes us a, a bit more efficient overall. If there are no questions on administration, we can move on to Park Maintenance, Maintenance Division. You'll see that we have an overall increase in this expenditure of $11,955. Our Park Maintenance Division obviously is responsible for all of the parks and facilities that the de department is responsible for and employs 7.3, the equivalent of 7.3 full-time employees. Um, the the uh, eleven thousand dollar or close to twelve thousand dollar increase is really attributable to personnel increases again, um, contractual obligations. Uh, but I would like to comment that we have consolidated two foreman positions into one general foreman position, uh, effective this year. In excuse me, effective July one, and um, that is the parks foreman and the and the park maintenance foreman and the grounds foreman. And so that position, which has been in the past, at least at long, as long as I have been in the position, has been already being managed by one employee, um, has now been effectively consolidated to uh, parks foreman. And he will oversee both, both jobs. There's also been an, a $2,400 increase in maintenance of buildings and improvements, and that um, that expense is for a couple of different things. We have playground safe, safety material that will be replaced this year, um, a guardrail at Old Mountain Field that will be extended out towards left field, and added um, funding for some vandalism repairs. Uh, one additional comment. The overall budget for uh, maintenance is going up by $11,955. However, as I mentioned last night, we're also picking up two more fields to do maintenance on for both the Hazard Field and the uh, South Road Extension Field off of the uh, uh, Curtis Corner Play Fields. That's generating about $9,400 in additional revenue to the department. So really the net cost on this one, uh, on this one department would be uh, uh, closer to $2,000 when you take into consideration the dollars coming in. Moving on to the Athletics Cost Center, the total budget, <coughs> excuse me, is $242,535, reflecting an $11,514 increase for the athletics program. This program funds 80% um, of one full-time employee, that's our athletics supervisor, um, his salary and benefits. And um, of note, in the seasonal salary line item, you'll notice an $8,755 increase. A portion of that is to implement a part-time basketball assistant for mainly for the travel program, which has become hugely successful and requires uh, a little bit more staff time in order to run it um, efficiently. You may want to mention the number of children that we've got enrolled in that program is over 700 this year. We have a record number of children involved in the program. We've established um, a program for younger kids at the five-year-old level, and we run right through the age of 18. Um, we have a, it's a tiered program where we have instructional, we have recreational, and then we have travel. Um, we have some kids that overlap in both programs. It's, it's very successful, and we're hoping to be able to um, continue it. However, at the, at the time, we can't expand any farther than we already have because we just don't have the, have the gym space. Can you just review what, what gyms are used, like Curtis Corner, how? We use. Basketball games. Oh, I'm sorry. Let me say into the mic. 
just to review the hours that are spent, I mean, I've been there with my son with the basketball games at the high school. What time they start and what time they end at the high school, Curtis Corner? It's sure, we use um, the gym at Curtis Corner, the gym at Broad Rock, uh, Broad Rock Middle School, the high school, and Peacedale. And at times, we even, for practice purposes, will utilize the Guild Gymnasium because we just don't have the space for all of the practices. The program runs on um, Saturdays all day on Saturdays at every gymnasium. We also have practice time available on weeknights as best we can. We, we also utilize at times the Prout um, Gymnasium as well. So we're, we're challenged to balance the other athletic programs that we offer, such as men's drop-in basketball, um, volleyball, dodgeball, these other programs that we know that people want to participate in, but we only have so much time at these gymnasiums. Um, start at like, I'm not even sure what time. Nine they o'clock. Nine. They start okay. at nine in the morning. Is it, is it going until six o'clock at uh, night? Four, four or five o'clock, you know, I'm not yeah. certain on, on the. I've seen cars even there at like six on Saturdays. I said, go but back. The, Maybe yeah. he's running late sometimes. The school department, you know, they'll, they give us what they can. Yeah. Um, and the program is, is, is a great program, but we've scrambled this year to find some extra space so that we could, in fact, continue the travel program. And you were using the back gym at the, the high school too? We, we utilized the, the smaller gym at the high school this year as well so that we could um, make room for the, some of the travel practices. And there's shared practices with, with teams as well so that there are two teams at, uh, at the gym at, at once um, using separate ends of the gymnasium. That's amazing, it's a credit to the, really the, the department you know, handling that number of kids. It's a, it's, a, it's a good program, thank you. We have a summer basketball program. Um, it's not as strong because there are other opportunities in the summer. Baseball takes, you know, takes control. Um, but certainly there are there are basketball programs that we run. You see, Old Mountain Field is is regularly busy. So we have the the benefit of the outdoor the outdoor courts too. We have some use of the school courts in the summertime, but we also use the schools for um, backup on day camp um, activities, inclement weather. Uh, we do run some basketball camps inside, though. Not as many, not, not nearly what we do um, during the fall and the winter. Not, we, can get the, we can get some hours in the schools, yes. Yes, because we don't have the same level of activity as in the winter. Right. Spaces are available, but recognize too that anytime we're in the school buildings, we're paying for the uh, custodial staff to be on online as well. For the council's information, what I put up on the board is in the athletics department, all the different programs that are being run. So if you can't see it from there, you've got the sports camps, that cost about $28,200. We're in incurring costs that are about $4,700 less than what the actual cost of the program is based on the revenue. Uh, there's no skate camp this year. The tennis program is, uh, runs at about $62,000. The drop-in league, uh, league play is about $14,000. The uh, youth basketball uh, is $35,000 for the uh, program administration. All of these generate uh, the user fees that we talked about to offset the uh, cost. Uh, instructional uh, basketball, travel basketball, volleyball, softball, all of those are programs within the, uh, the athletics budget itself. Uh, and that's where we come up with that overall cost of the uh, $242,500 uh, program. Terry, I just have a quick question. Do we, um, I know it, it, it states in here that we don't have any expan expansion for adult basketball. <coughs> do we have any um, adult basketball as it stands right now? We do, we do. We have a men's drop-in league, um, which we run in between the uh, youth basketball programming. Sunday mornings, um, we have the men's basketball drop-in, but we do have, have the demand for 
either an extended season or other time frames um, for programs like that. Okay, thank you. Carol? Terry, why don't, um, the gym at the Guild, it's just not, it's not in very good uh, condition. Is that why it's not used very often? No, it's, it's, it's very small, really. Oh, it it's the size of it. It's fine for the, the very young um, five, six, seven, eight-year-olds, but beyond that, it's just, it's constrained by the, by the size. Oh. It's that. also dangerous based on the way the heating units, the old heating units on the wall, the height of the, uh, the ceiling uh, and the piping across the ceiling. Uh, it's really not a place where you're going to have uh, competitive sports for the kids unless you're dealing with the bitty ball where uh, you've got you know, the, the, the five to seven year olds. Yeah. But outside of that, uh, someone could get injured in there. I'm sorry, I have one more question. And do, do we do anything as far as the older girls with basketball with the town of Narragansett? We have our, our own girls program. Um, we had collaborated with Narragansett last year. Um, this year we did not, but we ha do have a girls program. We actually consolidated the um, 9 to 12 year olds, 9 to 13 year old program this year because of the, of the numbers and uh, it worked better for, for us to be able to have enough teams in the, in the program. Right, thank you. The other thing I'd like to note in the athletics budget is that we did um, include $2,000 in the overtime line, which is really to, um, to account for the hours that our athletic supervisor may end up um, staying over at either the softball locations or basketball or tennis. Um, we overran it this year. We did not budget for it in the current year, but um, we wanted to make sure that in the coming year we had the necessary funds for that position. Holly? Did we uh, give up the sailing completely? As of this time, we do not have a sailing program. Any other questions? Yeah, uh, the seasonal salaries, uh, those, that's what the, uh, the bulk of the increase is for? Yes, that, that bulk really was um, pa partially for a part-time basketball, travel basketball coordinator, because that, that program just has become um, so popular. Thank you. Any other questions? Okay, next is the aquatics program, which is the town beach and our uh, surf camps. Um, you'll notice that there are, there's an overall increase of $2,052, which is related to personnel expenses, um, related really to the recommended um, two and a quarter percent increase for our seasonal staff. Um, what I would say about our aquatics program is that we do not intend to increase beach fees this year. Um, we were very successful last year, first of all, with the weather cooperating for so long. Um, secondly, we had a phenomenal uh, surf camp program that ran for four weeks and um, boosted our revenue quite significantly. We're intending to continue the surf camp programs with the possibility of adding um, a skimboard camp for a week. Um, and the, t the town beach, will, we anticipate that we'll still have, hold the same amount of rentals that we had last year, um, providing we have sand on the beach when May rolls around, and good weather. So we have a total uh, operational expense of $99,557 for um, the aquatics program. One thing I, I also might uh, would like to mention on the, on the town beach is we are intending this year to um, move the seating area of the pavilion, relocate it to the side of the pavilion because of erosion that has caused it to, to become structurally um, compromised, and that's, we're hoping to make sure to have that done before the beginning of the, of the summer season. Next is the Leisure Services Program. Essentially, the Leisure Services Program um, 
encompasses special events like the 4th of July, Children's Festival, um, Discovery and Extreme Summer Camps, the Nature Center programs, and some community education. Um, we are anticipating an overall decrease of about $9,187 with a total budget of $134,210. $134, You'll notice that the rental line and professional services lines have been reduced. As far as the professional services go, we have seen the loss of some of our independent contractors who run, run programs for youth and adults. Um, we are looking next year to try to increase the independent contractors, but we're, our expenses and revenues are directly related to how many programs that we are able to offer successfully. Um, we also are seeing a lower rental line because of lower bus fees. Um, last year we were able to reduce the um, bus rental rate and we anticipate um, being able to maintain that rate or, or very close to it um, <clears throat> for this particular program, the, the extreme camps and uh, the discovery camp. Um, and we are not anticipating or we are not projecting any increases in fees for the um, discovery or extreme camp programs. We feel that we're at a level that is affordable um, so that we will maintain a certain level of participation from the community members. We're also fortunate that we do have scholarship funds that are made available through the Friends of South Kingstown Parks and Recreation so that we can have uh, participants join us who may not be, may not have been able to otherwise. So we're, we're fortunate that we have the Friends um, to help support the scholarship program. This program also encompasses the Nature Center, and there's a number of programs that are run at the Nature Center at this point. Uh, in addition to that, this is where the dollars go for the 4th of July, uh, cost of the uh, services for the, uh, the fireworks, for the various concerts that are uh, held in addition to the, uh, the summer camps. Uh, You'll note that uh, there is no funding request this year for the uh, Wakefield uh, Civic Band, and uh, I, I think Terry may just want to mention that one. Um, if you recall, last in last year's budget, it was recommended that the uh, Wakefield Civic Orchestra um, be kind of set free as they were very successful in their um, endeavors for performing and raising funds for great causes like South County Hospital. Um, so they continue to be an um, integral part of the town. They run our um, concerts. They perform at Marina Park um, on Mondays in the summertime. And so we no longer have them as an expense for our leisure services program, but they are still very active and um, contribute to the town. They also are, come to our tree lighting um, event in December and perform for the tree lighting. And they've done quite well many programs that we hope we can see and see them become independent like this program. Creative activities. The creative activities account is also um, Stepping Stone School and you'll see that we have a total uh, operational budget of $78,175 which is a, um, a very nominal increase of um, $917. This, this account um, is responsible for community education programs like Safety First, um, also some preschool programming um, such as the uh, Discovering Dinosaurs and Under the Sea and other preschool um, educational programs, as well as the um, Stepping Stone School Preschool, which is morning and afternoon preschool classes. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, this year we we realized a decrease in <clears throat> sorry, excuse me, our afternoon attendance uh, registration for for Stepping Stone School. Um, this coming year, we intend to offer a three-year-old, four-year-old split class in the afternoon in order to boost those numbers so that we are at maximum capacity. Um, we have been. Uh, this past year, Stepping Stone School has been licensed by the state DCYF. Um, in years past, it has been licensed by the Department of Education. 
Um, licensing has become extremely stringent through the Department of Ed. Um, we were able to transfer our licensing over to DCYF. Um, as a matter of fact, they recently inspected and found uh, Stepping Stone School to be, um, be certainly uh, suitable for the program that we run. I'm sorry, Polly. We believe that it is due to just, uh, first of all, the economic conditions where there are people out of work and home with their children. We've also noted that other daycares and preschools in the area have also experienced a drop in numbers. Um, we're hoping that by offering the three-four split, we'll be able to pull in siblings and, and boost, that, boost that back up. Um, could you do all day? Is it possible to do like uh, until early afternoon, like a full day in school, or is that out of the question? Um, I don't know the answer to that. I, that, that I could think be the problem daycare. And know? I'm gonna. I'm, I hate to put working. Kathy on the spot. She just walked in the door. But <laughs> with regard to Stepping Stone School, full day. Are we? We're not licensed for full day, and I think it would be really hard with the facility. We don't have the facilities for lunch, and then that age has to have right. napping, and so it would be tough. I just thought it might be an option uh, to increase enrollment. Right, right, right. I know full day kindergarten is a is trending high yeah. now. Right, right. For and if you're a working parent, you know you need you'd have to accommodate exactly. for the afternoon if your child goes in the morning. Right. That's difficult, or right. vice versa. If there's no more other questions, we'll move on to the Neighborhood Guild. So if you go to, uh, actually we'll go to Peacedale offices first. Uh, so if you go to the uh, PDOB uh, tab number one. Uh, just to refresh everyone's memory, the Peacedale office building is utilized in two capacities. We uh, lease space to local uh, businesses and organizations as a form of uh, revenue generation, and we also utilize um, portions of the building for recreational programming. The total operational budget for the Peacedale office building for FY 11-12 is $90,289, reflecting an increase of $8,683. You'll note that we have an $8,000 um, allocation from the capital fund um, in order to pay for lighting um, in the parking lot and on the perimeter of the parking lot of the Peacedale office building, which is in conjunction with the Village Green Rehabilitation Project. Um, and we're hoping to see that um, completed in the very near future. Uh, that, that accounts for the, uh, the bulk of the increase for 2011-2012. Um, uh, we have renewed leases with five of our um, tenants over the past year um, for five-year terms with escalated um, annual increases, and we intend to renew two additional leases this year, the, the current year. Uh, we anticipate rental income at $75,834, which is a approximately $1,500 increase over last year. Um, we have our self-support programs, which include the yoga school, which is on the ground floor. Um, we also have Tai Chi, uh, aerobics and other fitness programming that takes place at the PDOB as well as a performing arts summer camp for youth that is run through the Peacedale office building. We anticipate our revenues at $16,500 um, and we also have investment income anticipated at $1,500. I would just like to point out that the ground floor yoga school has been uh, rehabbed since the March flood and um, it's in great shape. We have a new floor that is sub-paneled and able to be actually removed in the event that there is another, God forbid, another, <laughs> another 
flood. Um, we also have put some uh, mitigation measures in place, including a sump pump in the boiler room. There is a new boiler there, and we will be purchasing uh, floodgates for the the doorways of the Peacedale office building on the back side of the on the back side of the building to prevent um, that from happening again. But the uh, yoga studio looks fantastic, and um, we're starting to see an increase in participation in that in that program. I also wanted to point out that the uh, this is a special revenue fund which operates the Peacedale office building as of June 30 of uh, 2010 with the last audit. There's $214,000, uh, $214,150 to be exact, of undesignated fund balance. We are anticipating that that'll be about $218,000 when we close uh, the books on June 30 of 2011. Those dollars are used for the capital improvements. The $8,000 that we're talking about uh, is something that would be able to be funded out of that, uh, that reserve fund. Any major improvements that are made in that building and in fact, we've made many, many improvements over the, uh, uh, the period of time that we've owned it since 1983, whether it's new heating systems, electrical systems, painting, uh, new windows that were installed, all of those things are done based on what the town's uh, business plan was, which was to continue to use the first and the second floor for commercial operation for small businesses, and then to be able to use the uh, space on the third floor or basement uh, as a means of uh, providing for expansions of what had occurred at the Guild. So the program has been uh, quite successful and continues to be, and the building is in good shape at this point, if we can just keep the river out of it. I would also note that in the coming year, we, we intend to look at um, additional window replacement as well and some repairs of the, um, the chimneys at the, at the PDOB. Any questions? Move on to the Guild. Terry, excuse me, before we move on to the Guild, um, your yoga participants, are they coming from other private businesses, the Y, or are these new folks? Um, Whether we're, we're kind of stealing people from other no. organizations, I, I couldn't tell you, um, Jim. I don't know the answer to that. I have a feeling. Um, <clears throat> we probably have a kind of a distinctive population. It's a very affordable programming option compared to some of the private yoga studios. Um, and also the YMCA, YMCA also. There's a, a definitely um, kind of a uh, different levels of cost structure between the Y and private yoga studios as ours what, is. What do our costs run? I mean, is there a, a means based or is it a, <clears throat> one level for the different kind of instruction? Depending on what the program is, we have a, 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 we have a program where you can actually purchase 20 classes and then decide which classes you want to go to. It's like a menu of yoga, if you will, um, where people can pick and choose and our instructors are there quite, quite often, the, the, two, um, the two partners who really run, run the yoga school. So they're really two instructors? There are two instructors, and then there are student instructors who are being trained by our two um, managers, so to speak. Thank you. Terry, why don't you explain the, the business relationship with our third-party vendors as far as how they're paid? Because as I had mentioned last night, we may offer 60 classes. If we only receive participation that would warrant 40 classes, we run 40 classes. If we're going to offer 60, and we get uh, people that want 70 classes, we would run that. And what we're doing is we're paying the instructors a share of what the overall revenues that come in. So you may want to just touch on that because <clears throat> we don't have these as our employees. They're third party vendors. There's no, uh, there's no uh, employer employee relationship with them on the way this is uh, set up. That's why most of them are under a professional services line item rather than a personnel line item. We, we implement um, separate contracts, and these folks are independent contractors, and so there's a split of the overall revenue that comes in, uh, typically 70-30. Um, uh, there are exceptions to that, depending on what type of program and the popularity of the program, um, but we 
require our independent con contractors to sign off on, on a contract. Uh, we have um, parameters set in terms of what, what we will run based on the number of, of people signing up. So if we set, establish a figure of 20 people need to be in this class and we only get 15, then we, we don't run the program because it will be, um, won't be profitable for either the, the guild or, or the instructor. Ready for the guild? Okay, for the um, neighborhood guild, we have a total proposed operational budget of $834,192, representing an increase of $16,578, which is approximately 2% over the previous year. Um, the guild will remain self-sufficient with combined projected revenues in the amount of $834,000. Uh, $834,463,000 from programming and trust revenues. So there's the combination of, of the two revenue sources. Um, if we look at the administration cost center, you'll see that there's $438,460 $438, operational expenses with an increase of about $6,700. You'll notice that we have um, decreased person. Oh, excuse me, I'm losing my place here. We've increased our full-time salary line by five thousand seven hundred and sixty-six dollars, which is um, reflective of contractual obligations. We've had reductions in both postage and printing. Again, this is similar to the town budget where we've um, reduced the need for mailings. We are taking um, strides to send out our information electronically. Um, and we've also reduced the, uh, changed the specs of the brochure so that the printing costs are much um, significantly less. You'll notice also that the professional services line has increased slightly. Um, again, this is for the online registration capability and data management system. Um, the reason it hasn't jumped as high as the town budget is because there was an allocation in there for $4,000 for software management of our current system, and that will be applied towards a new system um, to help us become more efficient with our registration and more convenient for the public. We have an overall increase of $6,695 in administration. Again, this is um, staffing for uh, the Neighborhood Guild and our personnel, our <coughs> bro costs are broken up by applying a certain percentage of some staff between the town budget and the uh, guild budget based on what their um, functions are. Any questions on administration? Okay, moving on to the front desk operations. The total budget is $36,085 with a projected decrease of $2,849. The front desk um, budget or operation really encompasses um, our fitness room and um, the vending machines that we have within the guild. Um, you'll notice oh, we also will have a projected revenue of $28,500, um, which reflects an overall decrease of $6,500. We've seen that the fitness room participation has kind of plateaued or leveled off or possibly even decreased. Um, there was another gym that recently opened up um, in Narragansett. We do have some, some competition out there. Um, we are making strides to improve what we have in the fitness room. We've replaced the universal machine um, just very recently, and we intend to purchase a new piece of equipment, um, either a treadmill or elliptical machine um, this year to try to upgrade the room and, and, and keep our our customers coming back. Any 
Any questions on the front desk operation? You may want to move this along. As far as the senior program, the senior program is the bus trips and the administrative costs for the uh, for the bus trips. Those are also uh, the program revenues that come in uh, support support that offset that uh, that overall cost. Uh, as far as our uh, youth programs, again, similar to the recreation programs, we're on page uh, 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 NG5. Uh, as far as the, uh, the youth programs are concerned, those are the programs that uh, are run through the, uh, uh, through the guild proper. Uh, those are uh, level as far as the expenditures uh, are proposed for next year. Music program is principally the uh, music lessons that are provided. The, uh, uh, the uh, piano lessons are a major uh, uh, program component of the guild, always have been and hopefully always will be. Uh, the adult uh, uh, program activities, uh, those are different programs that uh, maybe the chess programs or uh, different types of uh, 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 cooking classes, those types of activities that, uh, that occur within that program. Uh, the adult, uh, the arts program, uh, all of these things are programs where the initiative needs to be there as far as the interest. We can get the instructors, then we have to determine whether the interest. That's why it's also going to be important to have that online registration so that we can have a better idea as to uh, getting people into the program is a lot easier than having to come into the guild, uh, the guild itself. Uh, I want to talk for a couple of minutes uh, or a minute on the, uh, the guild revenue structure. Uh, and that's presented to you uh, on page uh, NG6. And I've got a different breakout of it, but essentially the, the guild's revenues come from uh, really three sources, either the fund balance itself or the revenues come from the trust funds. Now, the trust funds are uh, providing $348,000. Our objective is to try to take the core services, that which we uh, talked about as the administration, where we're heating, light, electricity, as well as the general uh, core administrative cost of running that building, to have those paid for through the trust funds, as well as to have trust funds pay for the debt, uh, debt service or capital improvements that are uh, required. So as you can see, for the 11-12 years, it's about $423,988 that's uh, forecast to come in through the, through that, uh, uh, through the uh, trust funds or through the fund balance, another $25,500. All of the programs that we've talked about are uh, fee-based programs that will generate the uh, $385,000 uh, in cost. So again, Peacedale Office Building, Neighborhood Guild, there are no tax dollars that go in. Uh, we're either using the endowment funds that are, were provided to, uh, for the guild operation, or we're, uh, we're looking for uh, the services to be paid for through a, a, a fee-based system. There are programs that are run that are run at a uh, uh, at a cost plus. Those are programs that are seen as being important programs, or they may be seed programs. So we may be losing money on a program, but that doesn't go on for many years. So there's a, multiple, a multitude of the different programs that are run. What we present as a budget is what we anticipate to offer. What we actually expend will be based on what the interest is. And if we see uh, interest greater than what had been anticipated, we'll try to expand into that area. Other questions on the Guild? I just have one. The, the trust fund, is it for both the Guild and the Peacedale office building, or is it No, it's just, just for the Guild itself. Oh, okay. Any of the trust funds uh, that can only be used within uh, the, uh, the Guild property. There's a gray area which says that, uh, that it's uh, as long as the property is uh, Guild property and contiguous to the Guild, which allows us to get the stepping stone. It could also get to PDOB, but uh, uh, We've never seen that as really being what the intent of that endowment was. Are we meeting um, success with the senior trips? You're successful? Yes. Um, we actually ran 26 trips in the past year. That's 
at least two trips a month. Um, it does uh, focus on, or our, our most uh, highest level of participation is seen through seniors um, and, and varied trips that, that appeal to broad populations, uh, sports, Broadway shows, New York City, museums, um, so that it's good cross-section. Cross Carol, I do want to correct myself. Uh, we did, when we bought the property in 1983, we paid with Guild uh, reinvested income, 70% of that cost. Um, I, I don't recall exactly what the price of the building, I think it was about $175,000. 30% of that came from town budget and 70% came from reinvested income. The reinvested income is the money that goes into a separate account if the uh, endowment generates more than what we expend in the year. So we maintain two different accounts. That's why uh, when we did the million dollar improvement on the Guild uh, 18 years, uh, is it 18 years now? No, 16. 16 years ago, <laughs> the, uh, the, uh, all of the debt service on that is paid for through the Guild itself using reinvested income. So. Uh, we did spend money from the Guild as an expansion of, uh, of the Guild territorial property uh, in 1983 as a means of being able to get the Peace Deal off the field. Any other questions on the Guild budget? Any questions? That'll move us on to the Senior uh, uh, Services <coughs> Department. S1. Shifting hats. <laughs> I'm sorry. Are you shifting hats? Yes. Yes. Okay. Um, as Steve mentioned last night, the total proposed operating budget for the Department of Senior Services is seven hundred twenty-six thousand six hundred forty-eight dollars, which represents an, an eleven thousand five hundred sixty dollar increase um, of the total operating budget. A $341,653 transfer from the general fund is proposed, which represents. Just want to make sure I have this right. Reduction of 82.95. Okay, thank you. Just want to make sure I have my numbers right. Uh, reduction of 82.95. Um, <clears throat> it's estimated that about 65% of the total budget will be funded by a combination of municipal contributions from the town of South Kingstown, North Kingstown, and Narragansett. Um, as you are aware, um, the towns of North Kingstown and Narragansett share in our adult day services funding, and Narragansett also shares in the senior center and uh, nutrition funding. We'll start with our transportation. Transportation division consists of our senior van that transports South Kingstown residents to a variety of locations, uh, shopping, the senior center for meals, uh, pharmacies, banking, and things of that nature that are basic necessities for seniors who do not drive. Um, this is the only division within the department that is South Kingstown resident specific. Um, it is for residents only. Um, we just do not have the capacity to do any more than that. Um, we have a total budget of $62,160, which represents a decrease of $7,072. It's related um, directly to uh, benefits expense reduction in personnel. Um, we anticipate being able to hopefully purchase a new vehicle in the 2011-12 year. Um, to retire the current vehicle as, and use as a backup vehicle or potentially implement some um, shorter day trip programs using a, a, the sec that as a second vehicle. Any questions on transportation? Polly? Um, do they pay for the trips on the bus? No, there's no cost to the residents for any transportation that they use currently through the senior van, none. And again, this, uh, the van became uh, utilized for transportation to the senior center for the meal site uh, once the state uh, last year, two years ago now, had uh, imposed a higher fee for the people to be able to get there. Uh, the fee was such that uh, it was gonna be more than it cost them to go to lunch. 
Mm -hmm. uh, so at that point, we had not been using the van for the purpose of delivery to the meal site at the, uh, the senior center, but we changed that policy once uh, we saw that we were having people that were no longer able to get there because of what the service cost was uh, to ride the state bus. This is, a, you know, it, this is an expensive component of the seniors program, but in a community such as South Kingstown with 64 square miles and without public transportation availability other than on uh, very set routes uh, on state roads, it's very difficult for us to be able to get our population in uh, if they don't have somebody to drive them to get them in for either uh, shopping purposes or uh, to be able to get to the, uh, the senior center itself. So uh, we recognize the expense of the program, not just the operation, but the uh, replacement costs on the van itself, which is over $100,000 usually. But well, it is a, uh, a, a vital uh, transportation link for that, uh, that portion of the population that uses it. I just have one question. Uh, Terry, does it only transport within South Kingstown? I mean, does it take them? Yes, with the exception of the stop and shop in Narragansett oh, okay. for, for grocery shopping. Otherwise, it's, it's strictly South Kingstown, which services most needs, pharmacies, banking, right. those That's types good. of things. We want to see whether we can get a Stop and Shop to give us a card so that we I can buy the so. gas cheaper with all the people that use the bus. <laughs> They'll find a way. <laughs> uh, why don't we move on to the okay. nutrition program? Uh, the Senior Nutrition Program budget is uh, $100,367, $100, which is about a 1.2% um, decrease over the previous year. Um, again, this program is the uh, meal site program. It is the Title 3C federal program in that we are um, a meal site for seniors who can come and have a, a full meal at a suggested donation of $3 per meal. Um, if they can't afford it, they don't pay. Um, we are uh, provided those meals by um, West Bay Community Action, which receives the funding for this catering service. They have a number of other senior center sites that they also cater to, and they also provide meals for our adult day services program. I wanted to point out on page S6, a change that we made as far as the uh, share funding with Narragansett for the 2011-2012 uh, year. What we were seeing is a substantial fluctuation from year to year as far as the percentage shares that each of the communities had. So what uh, I've uh, suggested be done this year and uh, is, to t is to really use a three to a five year average. And what we've done on the first block that's there uh, and what's up on the, uh, the board is to take a look at what the number of meals that have been served over a three year period and where do those uh, folks that uh, consume those meals hail from within South Kingstown and Narragansett. So what we end up with is that 68.3% of our cost should be South Kingstown, associated in 31.7. Uh, as a result of that, what we do is we look at what the program cost is, which is uh, listed at $100,367, less the revenues that we get. So we need to get uh, $95,685. So on a proportionate share basis, if Narragansett had 31.7% of all the meals served over that three year period, we're re asking them for reimbursement for that, uh, that share, which would be the uh, 30,336. The same uh, uh, approach as far as trying to uh, come up with numbers that are not going to be changing from 30% one year to 40% and then back down to 25% to have it so that the budgets will flow as far as the uh, uh, funding uh, shares are concerned. We're doing that with both this program as well as with the adult day services. With adult day, it becomes even more important because there we're not dealing just with one community, we're dealing with three. It'll be because we've got South Kingstown, Narragansett, and North Kingstown. I think it's also important to note that you can see that 10.6% of all the meals we've served over that three year period are uh, being consumed by people outside of those two towns. So we still do have some folks that come in from North Kingstown. We also have people that are visiting the area that would, uh, would use the meal site 
if they're visiting a, a family in South Kingstown and they wish to have that type of a, uh, a meal or to meet uh, or to network in the, in the senior center. So it's certainly uh, something we, we advocate uh, to be able to bring new people in at all times. Yes, Jim. Uh, why the drop from 2008 to 2010, uh, from yeah, 2008 to 2010? 8,300 meals, South Kings down to 7,255. Narragansett, 3,888, down to 2761. I'm not sure why there would be a drop, uh, a, why there was a drop as far as the number of uh, uh, meals. Uh, I'm not sure if Karen have, has any idea. some of our seniors and um, we're replacing the baby boomers are now coming in and we're hoping uh, to attract them to our meals program. Some of the people are choosing just to come to programs and not participate in the nutrition program but we've just uh, recently, actually last week, implemented a new a la carte menu which is lighter fare for the baby boomers coming in so we can attract them to, to participate in the nutrition program. So, uh, so far it's been successful. So. We're going to, uh, we, we'll starting two, we had, uh, but March it will be one day a week. Next, we're going to implement each, a new day, additional days um, each month as we go forward. But I think attracting the baby boomers is key. That's actually a trend statewide in that there is a, you know, a, a sense that the younger senior population is not interested in the congregate meal site. Um, so there have been some drops really across the state, but we're, we're doing some outreach and programs like the a la carte menu to really try to, to appeal to a different segment of the population. If there's no questions, uh, we'll move on to the adult day services on S8. The, uh, with the adult day services, we were able to get records going back four years. And what you can see on uh, S9 uh, is what the uh, number of client days were between North Kingstown, South Kingstown, and, uh, and Narragansett. So North Kingstown had a 34.5% uh, a uh, share, uh, Narragansett at 29.45. And what we've done in the request for funding support from both communities, we've requested the funding based on this schedule and we've provided the schedule to the communities. Again, our belief is that if we have uh, clients from North Kingstown that represent 40% this year and that drops off to 20% next year and goes back up to 35%, instead of us changing that where you're gonna see budget reductions and budget additions, if we can get a longer term period in there, what we'll be able to do is to be able to stabilize what the, uh, the overall percentages are. Adult day care is a little bit more difficult than the meals program in that uh, you may have one client that's going five days a week and is there. Uh, there may not be a lot of people going, but there'll be one person that really counts as five versus one that is coming only once or twice a week. So their location, if all of a sudden that person drops off in the first, uh, in the second year, you're gonna see major fluctuations. So the objective is to provide greater stability in terms of the percentage distribution and to make budgeting dip, uh, less difficult for each of the communities. The other thing we don't wanna do is to see a 15 or 20% increase in what we're asking for in any, uh, either of the two communities. Uh, adult Day Services uh, continues to be a, a well-populated program. We continue to operate at uh, uh, approximately, I believe, 18 to 19 client days, uh, client persons per day, uh, which is right at what our maximum is. There has been a waiting list in the past. I'm not sure where we stand with a waiting list at this point. It comes and goes right now because of the, depending on the client levels. Go ahead. Uh, it fluctuates. When we, we have people waiting in, in the wings when um, we may have four days that are at capacity and one day 
that is not. Um, we will bring in a client to try out the program for a day, but until we have available space to bring that client on for however many days they they need, we're 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 keeping them on a, on a waiting list, um, and that's a constant. We have clients who will go out sick for maybe a couple of weeks, maybe even a month, but we do not fill that slot because that client is expected to return. So it's kind of a, a, a balancing act. Um, but we certainly, there is certainly the need in the community. We've, um, our uh, case manager has done many, many home visits now and is, has been connected to potential clients and does the assessments with regard to uh, these clients as to whether or not they're suitable for the daycare. But um, we've, we've definitely see, seen a, a level of need there that should keep us at between 17 and 19 clients per day. Yes, Jim? Any help from the state, or is that gone? No, we do. We get reimbursed through um, state funding. Um, clients who are eligible for um, funding, will get, we will get reimbursed through the state. So that, that's part of our revenue source. Yes, when you look you at bill that. Bill the state, oh, I'm sorry, Steve, yeah, yeah, go ahead. I was gonna say, when you look at that, uh, the revenue statement, Jim, State clients next year are anticipated to be $101,456. The clients themselves on the, uh, the self-pay are at 98382 So there's a sizable portion. Uh, on a $300,000 program, the municipalities are paying a third of what the cost is by the time we're done with it. The, the payment is still not adequate for the distribution that's used because there's really three levels of, of, uh, of program participation. One is at zero cost to the client, another based on, uh, on a means test, they pay a portion, and a lot of it depends on how much the state will pay using uh, the Medicaid dollars. Uh, but what we're forecasting at this point is based on what the historical trends have been for the existing client base, because if we end up with three people that come in that are no pays, and we're only getting, I think it's $48 from the state, on a per day basis, we're losing money on that client. Uh, so that's why you have to have the municipal support to be able to make up that. And in fact, when I do the analysis on a yearly basis to look at how much the client paid, how much was paid for by the state, and then how much is the share for specifically to South Kingstown, North Kingstown, it comes out pretty much the same uh, as far as where, where there's no real loss leader uh, by the time you're done but the reimbursement levels that the state provides are inadequate to be able to promote this type of a program for respite care for families. It's just, uh, it's, it's inadequate. Uh, unless the family is of means, they really have to determine whether or not they're going to go for multiple days or whether they're going to limit the number of days that they're able to participate in the program. That's not good. Does private insurance pay for any of this? Private insurance companies, no? There aren't too many of our clients that have, um, that I'm aware of that have long-term care insurance, which would probably apply to this. Um, but mainly it's, our private pays are up fairly high. We're at $80 a day and we do have some private pay, but most of them are, are Medicaid eligible to some degree. And we are not recommending um, fee increases at this time. If there's no questions, we'll move, move on to the senior center itself, and that starts on page S10. Uh, and the detail on the uh, uh, financials is on S11. The total program to operate the uh, uh, senior center uh, facility is $257,721. Uh, there's uh, state grants of $36,483 to offset those costs, as well as uh, $2,000 in revenue that's generated through classes that are uh, provided at the center itself. We're also using $5,000 from fund balance to offset uh, costs for the 2011-2012 year. That leaves us a uh, cost of $214,238 that needs to be uh, paid for through the municipalities. We, are, we have looked at what the active membership roles are. Uh, when we do look at that, 1,468 are active members from South Kingston, another 792 
that uh, uh, hail from Narragansett. Uh, we don't see that the the fact that somebody is a member from Narragansett that there would be proportionate share. If we did, we would be asking for seventy-five thousand dollars from uh, from Narragansett for that program participation. Since they are paying toward the nutrition program, what we are asking for is a general contribution of about fifty percent of what the proportionate share would be, or thirty-eight thousand dollars. Those letters have gone. I've heard from North Kingstown that uh, our request will be in the manager's budget. Uh, it's, uh, I, I haven't heard back from Narragansett as to what the funding level will be, but having talked with the manager, he's indicated full support for our programs. But again, what we're attempting to do is to uh, obtain a reasonable fair share. Core cost of operating that building, whether Narragansett uh, participants were there or not, are something that would be South Kingstown uh, based to begin with. Uh, so if we do receive the $38,000 contribution that we've requested, I think it's, uh, it's a fair share for the uh, shared services that are being provided. The increase for the overall operational costs of the senior center is really just attributable to personnel costs. I would point out that we do have under um, office equipment, $750 proposed allocation. We are interested in purchasing a laptop computer in order to um, accompany, we have an in-focus projector and um, we will be able to utilize that in any room in the building. Um, there's Wi-Fi at the senior center, so we'll be able to uh, tap into um, the web for web-based um, presentations. If people, uh, if we have presenters coming in to do health programs, educational programs, things like that, they'll be able to utilize um, the laptop along with the projector to, to present. Uh, we'll also be able to take that on the road when we do outreach to different um, senior housings or other agencies when we're doing our, our presentations to utilize some audiovisual um, aids. Are there any other questions on the senior program? I just have one question. The um, West Bay Community Action that provides the lunch, is that a yearly contract or multiple contract? And how many years have we had them? Uh, they've been in place for several years now. Uh, I believe that, uh, that they bid on that contract through the state to be able to get each of the different service areas. It's not, we provide the meal site, the state is providing the meal program. So any of the bidding as to who's gonna provide the services goes through the spec developed by the state and the award for each of the different counties. Any other questions? If not, uh, uh, Terry, the, any closing comments? Um, thank you for hearing us out on our proposed budgets. I would just like to mention that the senior program also um, continues a number of partnerships with uh, local um, organizations and not so local organizations. We just recently um, established a partnership with Roger Williams University to have their um, architecture program students come to the senior center and do some assessments and evaluations and look at the center in terms of its suitability for our clients. They'll also be interacting with clients um, so that they understand what the needs of that population are and going forward and potentially being able to design and construct facilities for um, the elderly. Um, we also have a partnership obviously with South County Hospital which is, has grown um, they'll be doing a uh, chronic disease management program in the near future. Um, we've also still maintain our partnerships with URI, um, with um, Perspectives. They bring their, their folks to our center to assist with a variety of um, volunteer duties. Uh, we also offer programs through the uh, senior employment program where we have folks who are employed through that state program and are receiving um, compensation, but they're actually working for the senior center. And they, I could go on and on, but just so that you're aware that, that there's, uh, we're not in a silo. We, we rely on and depend on other organizations to make our programs and services work. If I had to ask for an average capacity number, you, you have a lot of room for growth within your program, within the senior center building itself, food, service, et cetera? 
Uh, we, we have some room for growth in terms of our meal program. The dining room um, can certainly handle more seniors. I would say that we are reaching capacity on our activity levels and the room availability, space availability within the, the center. Um, we certainly have increased our fitness programs. There are all kinds of enrichment classes that are going on, language classes, book discussion, um, health programming. Karen and, and the staff have done a, a superb job of just increasing the opportunities for um, seniors within the community. So we are, we're, we're getting there. There are days when we don't have an inch to spare because of the level of activity. Putting green. I don't think there's room for a putting green. Maybe next to the bocce court out back. <laughs> Jim, one of the things we're also looking with is to create better utility with the, uh, uh, with the lodge area that we have there, where we can get curtains in place to be able to, to cordon off portions of that room to be able to provide uh, more dedicated space for smaller program activity. And that's something we'll be looking at, uh, we are looking at right now as to what the cost of those type of uh, accordion curtains would be that would allow us to cordon off the uh, portions of the room. And the largest meal day that we have each year is when the celebrity chefs come in. <laughs> <laughs> I was trying to avoid that. <laughs> what we may have to do to get the meals back up is to have more celebrity days. There you go. <laughs> more celebrity days. We welcome celebrity chefs anytime you want to come by. I think we're all set. To T Terry, I would just like to say thank you. Um, this was a well done presentation, and your plate is full. No, pl no pun intended. Thank you. And also, I'd like to thank Karen and Kathy Lalam. And I'd like to just take a minute to um, acknowledge Kathy for receiving her uh, award um, for recognition and dedication to our town for 25 years of service. So, thank you. All right, Mr. Shock, please come forward. Seniors to sewers. <laughs> oh. Gosh. We're going to start on uh, page N28. N28 is the Public Services Department Administration narrative and GF17. GF17 is Public Services Department line item detail. We're going to do the uh, public works departments first, then we'll go on to the, the, uh, the three utilities. 17. Uh, Steve, I've got the GF. What was the first one? GF 17 and N28. The uh, Public Services Administration uh, budget is $257,959 or $4,687 more than what the current year appropriation was that was available. The uh, administration uh, provides for all of the engineering, architectural reviews, working with the, uh, overseeing the various capital improvement projects, road programs, as well as we've developed a team approach into all of the uh, capital projects. John sits with each one of the departments that has capital projects and is responsible for uh, working with them on the spec development as well as the uh, actual construction supervision or management. Uh, the department is also responsible for all of the stormwater compliance, which the council is well aware of, or what, as well as uh, dealing with each of the road programs. <clears throat> We can walk through each of these items if you'd like. Uh, uh, there really is no change in this budget from what the prior year was. There's no change in the personnel other than the two and a quarter percent salary increase. Uh, if there's no questions, uh, I'll move on to the Streets and Highway Division. And I think that uh, with Streets and Highway, we're also looking at a very small increase. It's a 1% increase of $18,250 for operation of that, uh, uh, of that uh, uh, department. A Couple of uh, things, the, the questions always come up when we uh, have the type of uh, winter that we've had this year as to where do we stand with the, uh, with the snow removal budget and just as a uh, snapshot in time, 
So far, the, uh, uh, we have expended uh, through last week $278,000 roughly. Uh, and that's made up really of three components. Overtime is worth about 58,000. Sand acquisitions around 28,000. And salt, uh, uh, we purchased uh, $191,500 worth of salt. We are at this point approximately $47,000 over what the budget appropriation was for the 2010-2011 year. Uh, as I have said at uh, prior meetings, I think that the department has done a remarkable job with the circumstances that they've been uh, uh, faced with over this uh, winter season and continue to do a remarkable job in terms of trying to get uh, a handle on the potholes that uh, uh, are populating many of the town and state roads in South Kingstown. Uh, so there is going to be cost in the 10-11 year, which will be high. What we uh, do in the public services or public works uh, budget on an annual basis, if you look at uh, uh, on page GF18, uh, line 290, line 290 is a professional services account. The professional services is for $362,575. That is uh, really a catch-all for many of the services that uh, the department uh, uh, provides, some on a contract basis, some on uh, a third-party uh, uh, purchase basis. This pays for the uh, stone seal contribution on a yearly basis. It uh, also pays for uh, crack sealing, road striping, and what we will end up doing is using a portion of those dollars that'll have to be encumbered uh, to uh, be able to balance this budget uh, for June 30th of, uh, of 2011 with that uh, $47,000 uh, cost. I wanted to give you uh, some line items as to what goes into that uh, program. Our infrastructure component is about $343,000 in that, uh, of that $362,000. And uh, the infrastructure uh, is to deal with the, uh, the road improvements. And right now, we're looking at uh, stone sealing, a proc uh, having dollars set aside to, to do about seven and a half miles of road, which is the normal amount of uh, road uh, 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 renewal that is done on an annual basis. We're also looking at uh, uh, providing for crack sealing. Uh, this account also takes care of the uh, rubbish uh, uh, collection and disposal uh, costs associated with the, uh, with the department and the stormwater and testing. As we've said to you, with stormwater phase two, we're required to do additional uh, testing on our outfalls for stormwater. Uh, what we're seeing is increased cost there. Uh, that, as well as now, we're also required to do illicit discharge detection uh, reviews to determine whether third parties are entering a waste, uh, waste into our uh, systems where they do not have a legal right to be in the, uh, uh, the street drainage system. That also requires additional testing. So, uh, right now, we're looking at uh, uh, the potential to spend $13,000 on testing alone. Uh, some of that may be used as a DNA testing to determine the uh, source of the fecal, whether it is uh, 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 non-anthropogenic or whether it uh, is uh, from, uh, from human or uh, domesticated animal sources. All of these things is a brave new world in terms of what we're dealing with with, with, that, uh, with that overall program. But what we will have to do is to adjust that uh, $362,000 uh, as we go forward to bring this into balance. Or what we'll do is if we have other dollars within other programs that could be transferred in to offset that cost. My objective would be to find the dollars either within the department itself or in other departments and transfer that in in June uh, rather than lose the money that's necessary for uh, keeping up with the stone seal program itself. Uh, so yes, it's been a, a tough year. We will be able to manage through it, and we're at about $50,000 over. We've just been able to re uh, replenish the sand, uh, uh, the salt that uh, uh, the salt budget that we have. I think at this point we 
probably have sufficient uh, amounts to get us through the remainder of the year. John, are there specific accounts within that uh, department you want to talk about? John, can you turn that mic on? Yeah, the, the, what I was uh, stating was we worked, uh, we had more coordination this year with DOT than we probably had in the past. In fact, they even let us go to their North Kingston garage and grab some salt because all the communities were running out. So DOT, I give them credit, they're, they're having a forum, they're going around the state. The first one's in South County for the Public Works uh, Department since the 25th of March. So they're looking to strategize for future years on what can we do better in coordination with the state. I know one of the things that we want them to look at is pre-treated salt, because salt is really only effective down to about 22 degrees. They have pre-treated salt, which to date has not been available. So we're gonna at least uh, make that inquiry to see if we can get pre-treated salt that will reduce the uh, low of the freezing point to less than 22. So there is, you know, I, I think it's a good thing that the state is is coming forward to the communities and trying to see what we need and how we can help them out as well. Uh, Steve, what line item is the sand and salt in here? That would be under the uh, uh, chemicals uh, 302 line item. And um, the overtime for all the excessive snow that we had. The seasonal year. salaries what you got for $50,000. So we didn't, oh, is that where that is? That would be hiring outside? No, we do not hire. Uh, that we, we call it senior uh, seasonal uh, here, but it's really for overtime for our department membership. Oh, okay. We do not use anybody at this point uh, that's outside of the town's employee for the sanding and sand salt and uh, plowing operation. Uh, we have developed teams that uh, involve both the uh, public works employees uh, parks and Recreation, as well as the Wastewater and Water Divisions, to be able to man the uh, 11 sanding routes and the 22 uh, plow routes that, uh, that, that we need to uh, uh, provide uh, support for during a major snow event. Our objective would be to have it all in-house. We have better control and better quality control over the personnel in that manner. So these people are hired just to do the plowing? Because you, wouldn't you put it under uh, no. overtime? No, it's not overtime. The, in the past, we had we used it where we would hire third-party plows. Oh. We don't do that anymore, but we haven't changed the code. We could change that code into an overtime account, but that's where it's being paid out of right now because oh, okay. we've chosen to uh, to provide that as an overtime base with the employees. Candidly, by the time we we would be done hiring people on the outside, uh, we would probably be paying more in the long run than we are at an overtime rate. Mm -hmm. I, I think keeping it that way helps us segregate what our winter storm costs are versus, you know, overtime costs, summertime trees comes down. So we're able to segregate better what the, what the actual winter overtime costs are by having the two separate accounts. How about during the flood? Uh, did you have a lot of overtime then? Uh, yeah, we, we had some that wasn't charged to that account. That's strictly for a winter storm response. But, you know, hurricanes, flooding, right. those come out of the regular overtime account. Steve, excuse me, you mentioned uh, we just bought a load of salt, and then you said good for the rest of the year. Is that the 10-11 year, or is that? No, that's 10-11. You know, normally what we would do is to uh, look at uh, acquisition of salt in the off season. Uh, it just really depends on wh whether we've got the dollars to do that. Right now, we wouldn't. Uh, I'm not sure what your stockpile looks like at this point. We probably have a half a barn, but I mean, you know, it depends. It, it'll, it'll be good through the balance of this fiscal year, we hope. It's all weather dependent and perhaps even the beginning of next year, provided, you know, we'll see what the weather holds. But we will certainly sometime in the fall or early winter have to restock again. What was that? An 18 wheeler? Uh, how many? They come in trailer. Dumps? They come in trailer dumps. So what did we purchase? What did we spend on the last load? How big was that load? <laughs> Paul, how much? What's a? We, we normally get uh, about 35 tons per load, uh, and I believe it's 74 dollars a ton. We buy off the state contract, uh, and it's contracted to live to.
Any other questions on the uh, public works uh, uh, line item detail? If there isn't, uh, we can move on to the tree program. Uh, last year, we had uh, reduced the tree program down by about $10,000 as a means of trying to uh, balance budgets. What we're finding is that uh, we do not have sufficient dollars at this point to be able to meet the professional service requirements for dealing with the trees on the right of way. So what we've done is we've uh, increased from the uh, 14.5 up to $20,000 for the professional services. The highway department works in conjunction with the tree warden. Tree warden provides uh, supervision and direction to the, uh, to, the, to the highway department for the work that they can handle. Anything that's going to be in an upper level uh, is going to be handled through the tree warden, either through uh, for emergency uh, services or if we have a number of trees that need to be serviced, we'll put that out to bid uh, or for uh, quotes so we get three quotes on it from uh, different arborists to be able to do the work. But I think that what we're looking at is that we cut that back too far last year. Uh, this is, uh, uh, there is a need for us to have uh, a $5,600 increase in that account for the year. Uh, in a proper year, if we weren't in budgetary constraint, I think we would want to get this budget back up another $10,000 because what we're not doing is really uh, providing anything on the agricultural supplies. Uh, agricultural supplies is where we would buy new street trees and put young trees in where we would replace the old trees. Right now, we don't have the budget to be able to do that. At one time, that budget had, I believe, $20,000 in, uh, in both professional services and $20,000 uh, for the purchase of, uh, uh, of, of tree stock. Uh, the program's been, uh, been really reduced in scale, but it's going to have to be built up a little bit because particularly after this winter season, we've had some uh, real difficulty with the, uh, uh, with the tree canopy, and there's uh, some major work that needs to be done. Any questions? Moving on, street lighting. Street lighting is uh, uh, for all of the street lights in town as well as the flashing lights at the schools, uh, the flashing light on Woodruff Avenue. All of those are uh, four fee uh, charges from the, uh, from the national grid. Uh, we're estimating that the current year cost will be about $168,000. We've budgeted $173. Again, putting the budget together in December and January and seeing the changes that have occurred with oil prices, uh, a lot of the departments are going to be very, very tight this year, whether it's the police department with fuel oil or the, the public works department with fuel oil. We're also concerned with what uh, energy surcharges may be as far as the street lighting account. Uh, we're not looking to change the budget amount that's there, but we're saying to you it's, uh, uh, it's very close to the margin that uh, that we're, we're most likely going to hit, and it may be exceeded. We've also submitted a letter and a request uh, to National Grid to review, uh, and we've given them a list of uh, certain street lights that we think that the wattage should be reduced in, si in, in size as a way of providing energy efficiency. Uh, John's working in conjunction with National Grid. Uh, I'm not sure if they're working with him at this point, but it's a case where uh, we are attempting to get them in because it'll reduce our cost of service. Uh, the Public Works Department and the Police Department worked in conjunction for reviewing the existing lighting uh, base and coming up with the recommendations that were then forwarded to National Grid. Have you got any headway on that, John? No, it, even the last communication I had with them, I said if, you, if it's going to take too long to reduce the wattages, at least reduce our bill and then do the wattage, the bulb, the lamp reductions at, at your own leisure. Uh, she said she'd get back to me. <laughs> but I did go to actually, I went to a, a forum last Friday with the public works departments in the state and National Grid was there. A number of communities like Situate and Woonsocket have started eliminating street lights and Situate had this uh, lengthy tale that they went through a you know public hearing process, pu tons of public notice, identified all the streets that they were gonna remove, they did and then there was a backlash from the community for, you know, why did you remove my street light? So I don't think we want to go there. I think the first step is, is doing the wattage reductions, and we can see at that point how much our uh, monthly bill is going to be reduced. 
High Street versus a Route 1, are, are we paying for the... Uh... We, we pay for all street lights on state roads other than those on limited access highways. So really, I guess my analogy is the, the street lights that you see that are the goose, the cobra heads, the, like at the Wakefield cutoff or up at 138 that are on a meter, the state pays for those. But we pay for High Street, Route 108, Route 138. Those are all municipally, and that's not unique to South Kingston, that's statewide. Any idea what that bill is? How much of, the, of it's state related? Uh, I don't. It's, it's not separated when the bills come to us. It's not segregated state roads versus town roads. The, uh, the last account is the wastewater fund transfer. The wastewater fund transfer has nothing to do with the wastewater enterprise funds operation. It has to do solely with the fees that are necessary to pay for the services of the uh, town's on-site wastewater uh, coordinator, uh, who manages the uh, on-site wastewater uh, systems program for us. This is the system where all septic systems are being inspected over a seven-year period, and uh, with the inspections, then uh, correction uh, requirements are out for septic systems and uh, notice of violations on cesspools and the need to replace the cesspools within a five-year period or when the property changes hands. We have at this point, I believe, gone through six full years. We've uh, uh, got a uh, very good response in terms of uh, uh, the program uh, participation as well as uh, response as far as the people that have used the uh, C-SLIP program, which is a state program from uh, Water Resources to be able to uh, borrow money at 2% up to $25,000 uh, to be able to replace septic systems. So that's been an effective program. I think we're making some real headway. In fact, at the meeting that John and I were at uh, last week with the uh, DEM director, uh, South Kingstown was being recognized for the program that we have, and in fact, uh, is one that is being referred other communities to to see how the program operates. So the $9,200 cost for the overall cost of that, we can't, we operate that out of the wastewater enterprise fund, but because that has nothing to do with the street uh, wastewater system, it needs to have the transfer from the, uh, the general fund. So for the 11-12 uh, year, we're looking at a $200 increase over the $9,000 that was budgeted in current year uh, that will be transferred into the wastewater fund to offset those costs associated with that coordinator's position, the mailing that she has to do, as well as just the general administrative work in the computer. If there's no questions, we'll move on Steve, uh, to the water fund. Steve, excuse me. Um, one year left in that uh, program. Uh, do we have a, how many cesspools did we wind up uh, with that we had? I, I don't have a total number yet as to how many, I can tell you how many we've replaced. We just ran those and our, we replaced that residence. Re so far, I believe 230 cesspools have been replaced townwide. Replaced. Okay. And 90 septic systems that are failed have been repaired. So again, we, you know, because at least with the cesspool, there's a five year window. There's still a few years for people to do them unless the property changes hands. It sounds like pretty good compliance and yeah, I would to go if you had to. Um, I'm sorry. Maybe a couple hundred left. I would say that's a, probably a fair assessment. Yep. And who oversees this, John? Who oversees that's, this program? That's my. Uh, we have a pretreatment coordinator that works mm -hmm. at the wastewater plant, and he, he's there at the office two days, uh, two uh, two mornings a month, two mornings a week, I should say. And I, I noticed that you requested seventy-two hundred. Yeah. But it's proposed ninety-two hundred on the. Uh... When I. Uh, the cost that was submitted to me did not have the administrative cost as far as the mailing costs. Oh, okay. Those that, things that was in there, the difference so. you were talking about. So that's the mailing cost is the difference? It's mailing cost as well as uh, uh, the, uh, the supplies that they need in that office to operate because uh, there's the forms that have to be prepared that uh, are filled out as well as the reports that have to be sent out. We, we send out roughly 700 inspection notices a year. And then once, depending upon the inspection results that we receive back, if it's a cesspool or a uh, failed ISDS, then it has to go certified mail. So there's, there's quite a bit of expense as far as mailings go. So does that mean we had roughly 5,000 private systems in the town? There's about 6,300, I think, yep, roughly. 
Yeah, we can give you the details on that. I haven't, we haven't given the council an update uh, of recent. I think what I can get is a memo to show you what we have because it's quite impressive in terms of the, uh, uh, the number of uh, inspections that have been made. Relatively few uh, that are, are subject to violation. Relatively few that are cesspools that we had expected to see more, particularly in some of the, uh, the older areas uh, around the, uh, the, the, uh, the, the ponds themselves or in Middlebridge. Obviously, some of that in Middlebridge is because of the installation of the street sewer system, but the failure rate as well as the compliance when there was a notice of violation, uh, that's been very good. Um, like a Roy Carpenter's, was that considered, would they have 10 different systems for 400 units, now they've got one for 400, so now what's, what's how does that work in the average? Both Roy's and Mary's, as well as Waccamo Park, have been required to submit uh, wastewater uh, facilities plans. Those plans uh, then have to be approved through DEM as well as through, uh, through John's office. And John's been working with all three of those property owners to be able to come up with proper solutions for the wastewater management on each of those sites. It is a very, very difficult task because it takes a good deal of land, land mass as well as the fact that because it's in the special management uh, uh, area, it requires advanced technology uh, systems to be installed for, uh, for, the, uh, for the community septic systems. I know you're just driving by Roy, uh, <laughs> Roy uh, Little's uh, property. Uh, it looks like NASA there with their new uh, septic system in place. And the other problems with those advanced systems are they, we're finding out that they're more intended to be operated year round with the seasonality. Yes, that and becomes problematic. Yes, very problematic. <laughs> And, and we also send, just to let you know, those remediation plans do go to the Conservation Commission for advice and counsel as well. So the Conservation Commission has looked at all of those as well. I just have one more question, John. How often do, do you have to have this inspection on these private The inspection sectors? is it's performance based, so the inspector that you hire on there, when they return the inspection form, the homeowner gets a copy, the, the inspector keeps a copy, and the original goes back to us. So it's, it's performance-based. It mm -hmm. depends on the type of the system, the occupancy, the water consumption. So it's, it's up to the expertise of the inspector, mm -hmm. how he or she feels the next time it should be inspected, the next time it should be pumped. So the first time would be somebody buying a new home, they'd, they'd have to do it, or it would depend on when the last person inspected? Yeah, it's, it's not a, uh, we've had some of those, somebody who's purchased a home and you know the, the pre-purchase inspection, they've they've tried to give us that as the, the on-site wastewater inspection, and, and that's not as comprehensive as it needs, as the town requires. Oh. So we, they have to follow our format. Yeah, the inspectors, I mean, a lot of the homes I've worked with, the inspectors seem to really, it's almost an age factor. If, if you've got one of the original septic systems, in some cases, I'd like to see a one or two year reinspection. Yeah, some of the newer ones, three, five year. It's, it's really performance based. Yeah. And, oh. you know, as long as, I mean, the whole goal is to make sure that you capture the solids before they top over into the leaching field, because once that happens, the leaching field is, that's really a, a kiss of death for it. So it's, it's really performance-based, you know, certainly a, you know, a three-bedroom ISDS system that has one person isn't going to have the need for pumping and inspection, that one that has a family of four or six. So it, it's really performance-based. Well, those tanks so used to have steel baffles have all rusted out. I, you know, and, 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 and we were just looking at some the other day. I mean, the baffle replacement is a common occurrence. Okay, if we're set, we'll uh, move along to the Water Enterprise Fund. Again, when uh, each of the utilities uh, are independent of the tax base, the utilities uh, generate their revenue uh, based on the user fees associated with uh, the specific service that they provide to each of the, uh, uh, the homes or businesses that are served. We're on page uh, W1 of the Water Enterprise Fund. Uh, what's up on the board is a summary of the uh, uh, Water Enterprise Fund. We're looking at a budget of $963,949 or $4,989 over the current year. Uh, things of note within the uh, Water Enterprise Fund is that uh, we are looking at a rate increase that will be required 
We have not seen a rate increase in the last two years. Uh, the rate would go from uh, the existing rate that was set in July of 2008 from $165 to $175 as the uh, minimum base rate. That minimum base rate includes 5,000 cubic feet of water. And uh, the, uh, what we're also looking at is to increase the additional unit charge. When Jim asked about Roy's and Mary's, there you have one sewer connection, uh, you've got one water connection coming into the place with additional units. So you're charging, uh, let's use Mary's as an example, or Roy's as an example. You've got one main pipe that comes in, and then each of the additional uh, houses that have water service available are charged out right now at $69. That would go to $75. And again, these rates go back to, the, uh, to July of 2008 uh, since, the, uh, uh, since the last change in the rate. Uh, Another major change that won't occur during the 11-12 year, but will occur in the, uh, that will occur in the 11-12 year is that we're gonna be required based on new state law to go to a quarterly uh, billing system. So that means that our cost of service as far as administration from one single bill is gonna uh, quadruple because we're gonna to have to send out uh, quarterly bills. It's also gonna change the, uh, the, the way the bills are computed as far as what base rates are because essentially what the state is looking to do is to come up with what the core cost is associated with providing water uh, to a, uh, a specific location and then just charge on the excess. The, the objective is to uh, try to provide financial disincentive for people to use water. Uh, however, in South Kingstown, working uh, particularly with the South Shore, we've got a very serious difficulty. We do not have really uh, an abundance of year-round water use. Uh, most of our water use is during the summer months. Uh, and in fact, uh, over 61% 60, of our water base uh, customers use less than 5,000 cubic feet, so there is not excess water use. So when we set that rate next year on a quarterly basis, it may place greater burdens on uh, some of the year-round population than, than you would have anticipated. We have not been able to work out uh, exactly what the scoping will be of the core versus the excess uh, cost, but it is going to uh, require a major uh, change in the manner in which the, the water utility bills are sent out on that quarterly basis. Uh, we are poised to be able to do it without any major cost associated with field work based on the installation of the uh, walk-by meter readers. So uh, we can read all the water meters within a, uh, an hour to two hour period at this point, uh, and that is done right now monthly. Uh, the reason we do it monthly at this point is uh, particularly during the winter months is to look for leak detection where there may be uh, some type of problems in the homes that are, uh, that are closed down for the winter months. But uh, the change in the billing system, which has to be in effect as of January 1st of 2000 and, uh, 2012, or is it 2013, uh, we've got six months of the, of the oncoming fiscal year that will be required to go with a quarterly <coughs> billing unless there's some change in that statute, and I don't expect that's going to happen. Uh, I want to uh, talk for a minute on the uh, water systems uh, uh, rate uh, uh, revenue structure. One of the saving graces for operating our uh, water uh, systems, both for Middle Bridge and, and South Shore, is that we have $226,000 a year in offset, which is uh, monies coming in from cell rentals uh, on the uh, cell, rent cell antenna rentals on the two water tanks. Uh, in the narrative, we talk about uh, the number of units on each of the two tanks uh, at Mortucket and, uh, uh, and at uh, uh, Succotash. Uh, and right now, there are six cellular carriers at Victoria Lane, uh, of which four of those, the money is dedicated to the water fund. 
and on more tucket there's five cellular carriers with three of those carriers what we did is we stopped providing full revenues going into the water fund uh, and we've got that coming into the general fund as we talked about last night that's one of the miscellaneous revenue sources that we're using uh, as a means of offsetting uh, property tax uh, needs uh, but at the same time, even with $226,000 offsetting that uh, $963,000 cost, it's necessary to see the rate increase based on, the, uh, uh, based on what the costs are that we need to recover. Uh, we're expecting to be able to generate, uh, based on the customer base, uh, $703,000 uh, if that rate increase goes through. The, uh, the manner that uh, that we do the calculations on that is right now we're looking at uh, 2,755 customers within the water system itself. And th the chart that I'm looking at right now is on page uh, W4. Uh, at 275, uh, at, at the $175, we'll generate about uh, uh, $482,000. Oversized meters, again, I'll use Roy's as an example. It's an oversized pipe that goes in there. Uh, there's about $13,000 in revenue that will be generated from those sources. The additional units, 579 units at the $75 will generate $43,000. And then prorated, which are the new customers that come on during the course of the year, another $3,200. Excess sales, we're expecting about 5.5 uh, uh, million gallons of, uh, of excess sales. One of the things that uh, is a concern is that we've seen major fluctuation in the excess sales. And a lot of that may be because we uh, have precluded the use of uh, outdoor watering uh, during the summer months. Our uh, biggest year has been over uh, uh, 7.5 million. So obviously when you see a reduction there, you see a reduction in the <coughs> revenue stream coming in as well. So uh, the fact that uh, we need to uh, uh, conserve water based on concerns for, uh, for fire safety purposes and keeping the, uh, the standpipes full. It also has an economic impact on us if people are precluded from using the, uh, the water as they, uh, they see fit. Uh, when we look at the budget from last year, we had expected $698,000 in revenue from that source uh, from the, for the, uh, the customer base and we're really looking at about 660000 uh, 660, So uh, we're seeing less revenue come in as a result of reduced uh, water sales occurring in the area, but we have to uh, uh, curtail the use of the water if, in fact, we've got concerns on the ability to be able to keep those standpipes full. Those are two 400,000-gallon uh, tanks uh, that, uh, particularly uh, Fourth of July weekend or the holiday weekends, long weekends, uh, we've got difficulty being able to replenish those uh, during the uh, nighttime hours. Uh, and some of that is because some of the uh, automatic watering systems in many of the homes in the South Shore area are set for nighttime watering. So they're watering the lawns or the gardens at the same time that uh, the pumps are out straight trying to uh, fill those standpipes. It's, uh, you know, it, it's a problem that we'll have. I don't see that it's going to change because the water demands in Narragansett, which is also fed by United Water, <coughs> are the same as South Kingstown. As well as United Water's uh, loading is also higher during the summer months, uh, particularly with the, uh, the business community activity. So there is going to be certainly much more draw during the summer months, and uh, we're going to have difficulty being able to uh, replenish the supply. One of the questions is why not put another standpipe in as a means of uh, being able to do that. The cost of the standpipes are outrageously expensive and would only be used for two to three months of the year. So it doesn't make any type of economic sense. This is a chart that I don't have in the budget, but it's one that as we start to look at uh, producing uh, the changes in the water billing, we wanted to take a look at. And here's where we're talking about, uh, you can see that uh, over 60, 61% uh, are using less than 5,000 cubic feet of water. Uh, the, uh, the percentages that are, are there, uh, let's see if I can find it. Uh, 
61% uh, is below 5,000, 27% are between 5,000 cubic feet and 10,000 cubic feet, 7% are between 10,000 and 15, and 5,000 above 15,000 cubic feet. What I'm also trying to get a handle on is when those people are using the water, because my assumption is the first quarter of the July, August, September bill will have excess associated with it, and obviously when we go further, uh, particularly during the uh, November, December, January uh, period, we're going to see very little water use other than with a year-round population that's there. And how that is going to impact that new water billing system that's going to be re required to be instituted. But, you know, this is, uh, uh, this is atypical to uh, a year-round population. So, again, you're having to build a system that can accommodate the demand of July 4th on January 1st. So the infrastructure has to be put into place. Therefore, the cost associated uh, with providing that service is much higher than where it would be in an urbanized center. But that's, uh, that's what's necessary to be able to put that system into place. To give you an idea of, uh, of water rates, they're right across the board as far as uh, there's, no, there's no easy way of coming up with what, uh, what an average rate is. As in, for instance, in South Kingstown, we charge $165 right now for the 5,000 cubic feet. Kingston water for the same 5,000 uh, cubic feet charges $360. United water charges $166, so they're a buck over what we are. Narragansett's at 141. North Kingstown's at 196, and Westerly's in at $93. So when you get done, the average is about $191, but the average really doesn't make any difference because there's such a, uh, uh, there's, there's such a high and a low in the, uh, uh, in the review. When we look at 10,000 cubic feet of water, we're at $300. Kingston's at 456. United's at 266, so now they've dropped to almost $36, $34 below us. Narragansett's in at uh, uh, 212, so they're now down $80 from us. North Kingstown's up at 378. But now Westerly is up at 287, so they're only $12. So what we have to look at is that each of these systems is computing its core cost differently. So what I'm trying to get from the, from the state is some idea as to what they see as being the, uh, the core cost uh, presentation. I look at it and say that, you know, if we have to look at the administrative cost as well as the cost of the infrastructure maintenance, all of those are part of your core cost because you have to provide the water. The only thing that's excess is what the cost is of pumping the excess through the system once it's already put into place. So it's going to make for a, a, a difficult decision and it could also increase water rates to some, but it'll lower water rates for other people. But the people who will see the lesser water rates are those that are here only uh, seasonally who are paying a disproportionate uh, share right now because they're paying a year-round $165 even though they're using in some cases less than 1,000 cubic feet of water. So it's, it's going to be a difficult uh, uh, chore to be able to make those revisions next year. Yes, Jim. Which um, are the private companies? Uh, well, is Kingston... Um Kingston is a water district, so it's it, it's not a private company. It's a uh, it, it's a quasi public corporation. So they're not owned by the French. How about United or Dana? No, there's no fr that they are a uh, they have a franchise area within the village of Kingston to provide water service for. But uh, Kings it's, Kingston's it's, districts are set by the General Assembly. But Kingston, though, is is a basically a, a public. I guess it's a what quasi government. I'm sorry, John. It's quasi-government Kingston? It, it's a quasi-government. Uh, it was just like the water districts and fire districts that were set up many years ago. Many times the water districts were an offshoot of the fire district because they were providing uh, hydrant service. In Kingston, that's been split. The Kingston uh, water and fire districts used to be a single entity, I believe, and now they're two separate entities. So there are no foreign owners that you know of some of our water districts here, at least in Rhode Island and southern Rhode Island? Uh, I'm not aware of it. Uh, United Water is a private company, obviously, 
Narragansett, uh, North Kingstown, and Westerly are all municipal corporation, all operating as enterprise funds. But as I say, their standard rates are based on different uh, uh, considerations, uh, because and and ours will have to be based on uh, consideration looking at the, what uh, the service costs are now for the year-round resident, what they are now for the uh, part-time resident, and to try to come up with a way of providing a proper balance on that because we're still going to have to generate uh, the same you know, 300000 plus in, uh, in revenue from that rate base, but only in a different manner. This is more state regulation coming down, uh, which is going to impact a coastal community in a far different way than it would in an urban area. Is there a sales tax on water use? Pardon? Com the sales tax for commercial users. Commercial, right now. Marinas and theater by the sea, I don't know, like theater by the sea is commercial. You may have to ask me tomorrow that question. Yeah, I know, I know. It may be changing as we speak. That's <laughs> <laughs> true. Tonight I'll just simply say maybe. Okay. <laughs> John, you want to walk through anything on water The only training? thing I wanted to add was we, we are showing increase on maintenance of water tanks. We've gotten prices to try to deal with the the external mildew issue on two of the tanks. What I will say is we've had a number of contractors come look at them. They all told me we've never seen water tanks that high. <laughs> so one of the downsides is for the for the good aspect of revenue for the cell towers, it's problematic for the contractors to set up because we have the equipment shelters. So on Fort, I mean, more Tucket, I think, is going to be easier. That's a lower tank. Victoria Lane is very, very high. It's probably going to require filling along where the embankment is next to the ballpark. I don't particularly want to do that, but in order for us to be able to power wash it on a periodic basis, it's going to require access around the perimeter of the tank at the drip line of the tank. So we'll be talking with the Parks Department to try to minimize any disturbance, but I just want to let the council know we're probably going to have to remove some of those trees that were planted outside the fence line to try to provide access to, to clean the tank. I mean, we've looked at uh, different ways that it could be done other than uh, uh, using a truck, uh, whether or not it would be somebody uh, coming off at the top. Uh, the only way to do it is for us, we're going to have to remove trees. But at the same time, those tanks can't be left in the, uh, the condition that they're in right now. One of the other things that we've looked at with the, uh, uh, the uh, tank cleaning is one of the companies provides for a uh, anti-fungicide to be uh, put onto the tank after as a way of trying to minimize the amount of uh, uh, discoloration that's going to occur. We're not sure whether or not that's an effective deterrent. Yeah. Narragansett, it's a mildew inhibitor. They've used it on one tank already, and the manufacturer indicates that it's good for three to five years. So unfortunately, I think Maybe the good news is we be able to get them clean, but the bad news is eventually we're going to see that mildew come back again. You know, and, and you know what, Kathy, you're right. And that's the ironic thing is the old paint surface was actually very rough. You could take your hand and wipe it, and it looks like chalk when you're done. This is a high-gloss finish. And for whatever reason, that, that mildew likes that finish better than the old. Of course, the old paint was lead paint, too. So maybe the mildew couldn't survive with the lead. I don't know, but uh. my theory is Polly just picked the wrong color. No, no, <laughs> Polly was right. <laughs> so Polly and I picked another color, and John was like, "Old." Oh, remember that night? I remember. I do, I we, do. If you had gone with us, it would have been yeah. a nice shade no, of purple. I wasn't. And green. I wasn't going to take responsibility. <laughs> <laughs> and you were like, "No, no, don't pick that." One. How with expensive is it to paint things? <laughs> oh, it's they were a, they were about a half a million dollars a piece. So cleaning it is much easier. Yeah. John, what's the height of Victoria Lane to the top? Lucian, how tall is Vic? Well, it's the, the overflow elevation is 210 feet mean sea level. It's probably about 180 feet. Victoria, 173 feet, 175. And usually what they're telling us is once you get above 150, 160, it gets really iffy on how much they can reach with a, this is with a man lift that's stationary on the ground. So I wouldn't want that job, but. Uh, Tough work. 
<laughs> and you've been up there and measured it. You, yeah. He's okay as long as he's got one foot on the ground. I dropped him. <laughs> if there's no questions, can we move on to the wastewater enterprise fund? Where are we, Steve? What numbers now? WW1, Jim. Thank you. There's no double pages this time. It's just uh, staying with the one enterprise fund. Oh, I see that. <laughs> so WW1, we're looking at a, uh, a program which is a $112,000 reduction from the current year. As I mentioned last night, there's really two reasons for that. One is that there's a reduction of $50,000 in capital improvements that's recommended for the 11-12 year. And secondly, uh, Bernie deserves a lot of credit in terms of working with National Grid and uh, the energy savings that uh, have been, uh, uh, been developed. The, uh, the council will recall that, they've, uh, that we've provided authorization for the replacement of two, uh, uh, two blowers, and those blowers will save probably around $45,000 in electricity uh, on an annual basis from what had been there based on the original equipment that was there. And I'll let John talk to that uh, uh, a little bit. We'll let Bernie talk to it because he knows it better than I do. Well, I wanted yeah, you to well, talk, we but I don't think Bernie understands it. <laughs> well, the, the, well the, I guess there's, there's two good uh, messages with this program. One is we replaced 30-year-old blowers with a grant of how much, Bernie, was it? 140000 So we just replaced, you know, the original equipment, and we're getting a tremendous savings with this high efficiency. Uh, it's, I think it's what Korean technology. And uh, it actually, Bernie's had a number of other facilities come down and and look at. It's kind of a model in New England, so it's really proved very beneficial. I mean, the estimate's 250,000 kilowatts uh, of less energy use uh, over the course of a year. Uh, so, for us to be able to replace 30-year-old equipment with National Grid paying a portion of that and be able to take the energy savings has been a win-win. Replace a generator too, is it, what was that? Well, the generator is in process. That's not really um, an energy efficiency as more, more of it is, it's, it's an age issue. That's for Silver Lake pump station. But I would think that that would be energy efficient putting a new one in. I that would yeah, I mean the generator, I mean, you, you gotta remember that the generators are only used seldom for backup purposes, so. I don't know if there's efficiencies in the generator end of it. I mean, the engines, it's a diesel engine. Yeah. <laughs> I don't think, no new technology yet for that. A couple of things that, uh, that I would like to point out, just uh, jumping around a little bit, is uh, if you look at uh, page uh, WW10, I wanted to point out the impact of the floods last year. And when you take a look at WW10, which is the total system use, and you look at the flows that uh, we accommodated during the month of March and April, uh, where we were averaging somewhere in the area of 100 uh, uh, million gallons per month over the prior <coughs> five to six years, uh, in the 2009-10 year, uh, we were looking at that jumping up by 50% uh, in terms of uh, the month of March. And that's from not just South Kingstown, but that's South Kingstown, Narragansett, and the university in terms of uh, influent uh, getting into our, uh, our uh, wastewater system. So you can see what, uh, this is still one of those uh, unrecorded costs that was associated with the uh, with that flood. Uh, the there's, there's two ways that that happens. It's it's called infiltration inflow. Infiltration is the groundwater tables higher than the, the mains in the ground, and it infiltrates in through pipes. Fortunately, our system is relatively young. We don't have that problem. The bigger problem that we have is inflow, like when High Street goes underwater. If you think of all those manhole covers with the one-inch holes. The water goes right in there. Now we, we put what's called flying sauces in some of them that are like the old things you had when you, that, that are inserts to try to prevent that, but it's still 
very, very difficult when you get that much water that we had last year to prevent any of that from happening. Another thing I wanted to point out as far as our enterprise funds are concerned is that we take the full depreciation value and show that in the budget and recover the cost associated with depreciation on the equipment. What that will allow us to do is to increase the value of the retained earnings so at the time the capital replacements are necessary, rather than having a capital budget, you'll have the retained earnings available to be able to dedicate to those capital improvements. It's, uh, it's better accounting in this manner because what you're doing is you're expensing the equipment and paying for it in the year that it's expensed. So if you have a 20-year pump, uh, if you take a, a straight line depreciation on that over the 20 year period and it, uh, you know, if it costs $20,000, there's a thousand dollars in depreciation each year. There should be a thousand dollars put toward the operational cost as a way to put that money aside. So at the end of the 20 years, the retained earnings is holding $20,000 to replace that, uh, that, that pump. So, uh, cer certainly that's somewhat simplistic in terms of the explanation, but that's what depreciation is. Here we're looking at the depreciation on this system of about $340,000 a year. That $340,000 is recorded as part of the cost of the $3.2 million that you're looking at. If a community really wanted to uh, skate around that cost, they could reduce what their expenses were, but they would always uh, have uh, spikes as far as the capital improvements that would be necessary to be able to accommodate uh, uh, the improvements at the time that replacement was necessary. So depreciation is required from uh, 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 an accounting standard. We are meeting that with water, wastewater, and, uh, and our uh, uh, solid waste uh, program as well. We will also be looking for a rate increase for the 2011-2012 uh, year. The uh, rate is uh, to increase from $220 per unit to $225, a $5 increase. We're also looking to increase the uh, excess consumption, which is uh, measured over 10,000 cubic feet of uh, water use, and that would go from uh, the $2.75 that the council set last year for the 10-11 year to a rate of uh, uh, $2.85 for the water consumed during 11-12. So we're going to be asking for the $5 increase and the uh, uh, 10 cent increase as far as the excess as a way of meeting uh, the expanded costs associated with the local share that's necessary for, for the program. Again, uh, that will meet all of our both operational uh, and non-operational expenses. Uh, as the council is aware, we also pay debt service through the enterprise fund associated with the uh, two expansions of the sewer, uh, sewer system, one in Middlebridge. And uh, it doesn't seem possible, but the 20th year of payments will be coming in, I think, the 12-13 year, and that will close out uh, the Middlebridge uh, wastewater bond. Uh, the second bond for the Diane Drive, uh, I think we're five, four years into that at this point, so I think we've still got uh, 15 or 16 years left. Those are being paid for based on the assessments against the properties, both in Middlebridge and the assessments against those in the Diane Drive uh, area off of Old North Road. So uh, those programs uh, continue to, uh, uh, to work well. We are at a point now where uh, that wastewater system now has 12 pumping stations associated with it. When the system was initially installed, I think that we had uh, the Kingston, the uh, Silver Lake, the hospital, and Salt, and Salt Pond, and everything else from there has been expansions. That also adds to our cost of uh, cost of uh, process and operation. Uh, but I think that uh, all in all, when you look at the entire wastewater system and the operation that's there, and the cost savings that have been realized over the last couple of years. Uh, we're doing extremely well. I think there's one more energy in improvement project that uh, 
uh, we've got under consideration at this point with National Grid. And I'm not the deal. Uh, well, the, the blowers uh, provide the aeration to the to the aeration tanks. So right now it's manually set by the operators. So what we're looking to do is procure what's called um, DO, the dissolved oxygen sensors. And so the sensors that would probes that would go into the tank would control the blower. So it's a it's a dynamic feedback loop. So they're continually changing based upon the oxygen levels that are in the tanks. Why is the um, revenue down for Narragansett and URI? If you look at uh, page WW14, the, the manner in which we establish cost share between URI, South Kingstown, and Narragansett is based on utilization of each of the sewer components. On page 14, we break out each of the different components. So you've got the general process and treatment, sludge process. Those two are shared based on the flows that come in from Narragansett, URI, or South Kingstown. So as you can see, each of those is shown, just using Narragansett as the illustration, Narragansett has 44.42% of the flow. Because Narragansett has 44.42% of the flow, they will pay 44.42% of the general process cost of $623,000. So that's how they come up with their share at $276,000. We do that for each of the components. When you get to Silver Lake Pumping Station, obviously uh, Narragansett's not using that at all. So 33% of the flow that goes through uh, Silver Lake comes from the university, so URI would pay the cost associated with 33% of that 181,000 that it costs to run that pumping station. So we go through that exercise on each one of the different components. On, and when you get down to the user accounting, the user accounting is solely South Kingstown because we're not sending out the bills to URI or Narragansett. When we look at the local collection system, that's just South Kingstown, so we pay 100% of that cost <coughs> and so forth. So when you get done with the whole thing, you get to the bottom line, uh, Narragansett's share works out to be the $711,000, which is a reduction of about $72,000 from last year. URI's reduction is 27,000, and South Kingstown is about a $1,300 increase. South Kingstown seeing an increased flow uh, projection uh, as one of the reasons behind it, and also because when you look at the uh, capital improvements, the capital improvements this year, most of the capital improvements have got local share that are associated with South Kingstown. Mm -hmm. There's very little that's going for the, uh, the core plant uh, facility improvements. There's only $35,000 that Narragansett's paying. So that's why you end up uh, with those type of differentials on a yearly basis. It's based on the flow going into the system, how it is metered through each of the different uh, pieces of the, uh, of the overall system. And then at the end of the year, this is a forecast. At the end of the year, John comes up with what the final flow numbers were for each of the different communities. Those then go to Allen, and Allen then adjusts what the actual expenses will be. So that if, in fact, Narragansett's share and what we forecast at 44.42 ended up being 46%, they would pay more. So they would pay the actual cost of the operation based on the percentage flows that they had. So too with each of the other, uh, other uh, uh, shareholders within the, uh, the program. So are you saying that their uh, use or flow is down from last year and the year before? Is that what you're saying? I mean, I, I understand how you went through all this and determined the percentage, but I'm just wondering what are they, you know, how do you, re how did their flow reduce Well, the itself? reason their flow, the reason they're going down is because there was a higher cost on capital improvements last year. Okay, than so it's all year. about the capital that's, improvements. That's, that's. Okay. I see. But you're also seeing, if you go back to page WW9, WW9 shows the, uh, the <coughs> flows that are, that are uh, projected for the 10-11 year. And those flows are based on actuals through, uh, I believe, November. Uh, 
And what we're seeing is that uh, we're anticipating that Narragansett's flows uh, will be down. All three of the community's uh, flows are going to be down, but Narragansett's flows are down from 493 million gallons down to 431, based on the estimate that John prepared at the, uh, when the budget was prepared in December. Are there limits as to what each of the three members can, what percentage they can take, or does it all work out in the uh, it's capital all, expenditures? It's, it's all flow-based. All flow. Everything is based on flow metering and where those expenditures are spent. And again, the cap, as the manager indicated, the capital budget does have an effect each year depending upon if the capital items are more South Kingston. So, like if we do repairs to one of our local pump stations, that capital cost is 100% South Kingstown's. If we do Silver Lake, it split the 65-35 split. So it really all depends what capital items are being done in given fiscal year. So it doesn't really make sense then. I mean, like if you look at Narragansett in July of uh, 2009 to 2010, it's 49.96. And then you go to 2010-2011, 30.81. They just, they're just going to use less? It's going to be less? Which, uh, the 9-10 year had the, uh, the, uh, oh, the flood, the right. floods, okay. which are going to affect all three of those estimates. So where they were using almost 70,000, uh, 70, uh, they're down to 47,000 on the prediction. And the prediction is based on taking the average of the, of the prior five years. Those are all actual flows other than... I'm just, I'm, December I'm just through. Like, confused as to why it would be different every year, that much different. Well, I mean, it could be. I mean, I'm looking at Narragansett for July of 09, 010, and 10, 11. 49.96, the only thing I can think of is that, that July we had heavy, heavy rains, mm. and they had a lot of eye infiltration inflow. 30.81, that's what they use this past July. That's right on the money. That's all from metering. Thank you. Yep. It's a huge drop. Carol, one of the things, the, the chart that I've got up on the board right now shows what the percentages are for the actuals for the last three years. So you can see that there is somewhat consistency there where Narragansett was at 45.6 actual, 45.1 actual, 44.27. And uh, so what we're, what we're seeing is we're not seeing a lot of variation that's there. Uh, but again, the percentage shares are not as important as what the cost allocations are for each of the departments. Because the $50,000 in reduced energy cost is related to sludge process and uh, general plan operation, <coughs> they're getting 44% of that $50,000 uh, $50, if they're paying for 44% of their total budget. Makes, makes much more sense. Thank you. <coughs> John, other things that you want to point out in wastewater? Nope. Nope, I think that covers everything. Are there questions council has on it, anything with wastewater? Uh, Steve, uh, Diane Drive and Middlebridge, has, have every, everyone that's supposed to connect, have they all connected? We have two connections down in Middlebridge, one, um, are they Actually, just holdouts or uh, well, financial? One, one was a, a hardship case. Okay. okay. Um, we're actually getting ready to send a letter out on that one. Another one, we've already sent a letter out. It's a cottage that never had any plumbing. We had understood that it since has plumbing. I've already talked to the property owner. They indicated that it still doesn't. So I think we had excellent compliance other than those two. I believe everybody in Diane Drive connected. They really had no choice that was... It was a swamp. <laughs> it, was, it was bad. <laughs> so everybody up there is connected. But, you know, a day in John's life sometimes is very strange because, I mean, we've, I, I've had calls from him where we sent out a uh, on-site uh, uh, inspection requirement and found out the person had been tied into the sewer system since 1978 and had never received a, uh, a sewer bill, nor did we have any record they were ever connected to the system. So, I mean, there's, there's some strange stuff that goes on. 
but we then back bill them for 30 years and move on from there. <laughs> Actually, we didn't do that, but uh, that was John's suggestion. I, I <laughs> trying to increase revenues. <laughs> if we uh, move on to the uh, solid waste uh, department, we're really in the, uh, if, if you look at page SW3, uh, I'm going to skip the narrative and just go to the, uh, the numbers. You really have two different budgets that are within the enterprise fund for solid waste. The first is uh, the total operations, which is the operation of the transfer station. And you can see that that's a $443,936 uh, program budget, $8,399. The lion's share of the cost there is the uh, resource recovery tipping fee. You see that the line item there is $285,312. That's a simple calculation of taking the number of tons that we can bring to the, the, to the state landfill uh, within our cap, and our cap next year will be 8,916 tons is what we're expecting at $32. So if you multiply 32 times the uh, 8916, uh, the cost is 285,312. The other costs there are for the general administration, uh, John's office, as well as the fringe benefits associated with it. Uh, and our overall cost is the 443,000. When we look at uh, revenues coming in, uh, on the bottom of the chart, you see the revenues from the hauling licenses, the metered tonnage, and the transfer station rental and the tags uh, and miscellaneous and investment income. Uh, again, the $285,312 is shown as a uh, revenue, which is an offset to the, what we pay to the, to the landfill. So uh, of that 443,000, it's a wash between the 285 and the 285 for the, for the meter tonnage in dealing with the contract. As the council's aware, we have a third party vendor that runs the transfer station on the town's behalf. We amended the contract with the, uh, con uh, with the waste uh, management, waste haulers, waste haulers uh, last year, and we changed the rental structure there with now they're paying as a buck uh, a ton for every ton that they're processing, uh, two bucks a ton for every ton that's processed through the facility. We're expecting that that'll generate $118,000 in income. If you recall, it was a dollar a ton before we did the contract extension for the three years. Uh, so you got $118,000 coming in there. As far as the tag rental, we also changed that in the contract where we're now guaranteed to receive uh, on sales of 125,000 uh, tags. So if he sells only 90,000 tags, he still will compensate the town as if he sold 125,000. If he sells more than 125, he will pay us the excess. Uh, the rate that we receive per tag is 53 cents for each tag that he sells. What our concern was was that there was little supervision going on at the uh, tipping station itself for the residents. And there were some bags that were getting in without tags. So what we said is if you're not gonna manage the site by having a full-time staff person there, then we want a guarantee of 125,000 uh, bag tags being sold a year. If you sell them, that's fine. If you don't sell them, at least we're guaranteed what we believe should be the income based on prior year uses of the, uh, the transfer station. They agreed to that arrangement so we now have the guarantee of no less uh, than $66,250 uh, in revenue. And if uh, there's a greater uh, uh, sales than the 125,000, which would behoove him to do because he gets a buck 27 for every tag he sells. So it's a dollar 80. What we were also able to do is to prevent any increase in the bag tag cost in 1011 and in 1112. So I think we've been very successful in terms of the contract amendments that have been made. We also, in those contract amendments, have specific capital improvements that they will be required to uh, complete. Those capital improvements include uh, 
the construction of a second scale house, uh, construction of a uh, uh, building addition for dealing with uh, recycling uh, materials, and John, uh, what are the other other ones I'm, I'm missing? He's got to install some netting, some permanent netting to try to control the litter. He's, he needs to ex he's, we're going to allow him to expand the, uh, the bulky yard waste drop-off area. So it's really efficiency improvements to help not just the residential users, but the commercial users as well. So that's the, uh, the operations component of the Enterprise Fund for 1112. I want to move on to the second component of the, uh, the program, which really uh, should be captioned as the uh, landfill uh, reclamation program. Uh, because what we're looking at now, and this is also on page SW3, is I've isolated all of the costs that are associated with uh, the closeout of the Rose Hill and West Kingston uh, landfills that are directly related to uh, South Kingstown in terms of uh, uh, future costs as we go forward. The interest and principle that's shown here is the interest and principle on the two bonds that uh, were uh, sold by the town for Rose Hill and for uh, uh, West Kingston. The repayment schedule at this point is 138,000 in principle and about 35,000 in interest for the 11-12 year. Those are fixed prices. As far as the Rose Hill DEM reimbursement, this is the first year that you're seeing that, and what the uh, what that entails is the, the town signed a consent agreement with DEM and EPA uh, on the closeout of the Rose Hill, not, uh, not Plains Road, but the Rose Hill landfill. And essentially the overall cost of doing that entire facility, all of the engineering, all of the construction, Rose Hill, uh, my cost at this point is about $22.5 million was spent. South Kingstown was required to uh, pay upfront uh, cost to the feds of $2 million plus a PRP uh, share of about $1.1 million. What we also had to do is to then uh, agree to reimburse 30% of what the costs were that the state of Rhode Island through DEM incurred. So DEM's uh, cost are forecast at about uh, uh, $8 million. We're paying 30% of that. 15% from South Kingstown, 15% from, uh, from Narragansett. <clears throat> so at this point, we have a 27-year schedule at no interest to pay the state back what they've already incurred. That first year cost is uh, uh, forecast at $72,419. In addition to that, John's got responsibilities to be able to uh, do maintenance on that, uh, on that Rose Hill cap. The maintenance is probably the uh, uh, mowing of the cap once or twice a year. Uh, Narragansett and South Kingstown share 50-50 on whatever the cost of that is. We're expecting about $10,000 in cost for South Kingstown. If there's washouts uh, or erosion that have to be repaired, we'll have to do that work within that $10,000 uh, framework. As far as West Kingston is concerned, we're looking at the same type of an O&M cost as far as maintenance of that cap on that facility. Uh, the, uh, we are also going to be required to do well testing on both facilities to ensure that the uh, outflow uh, of any type of uh, pollution from the sites has ceased or there'll have to be additional corrective actions taken. So we're expecting that, uh, that the well testing in that area in West Kingston will be South Kingstown share is about 8,000. In fact, I think the university share is probably close to the $35,000 because most of the wells are associated with their property and some of the problems they had with the site. And we're also using placeholders for legal work that will be necessary in terms of responding to EPA. Uh, we are still working with the neighbors there to be able to get the necessary legal documents in place and recorded based on uh, uh, restricted uh, land use covenants that have to be uh, put into place. Uh, 
we've had to have formal appraisals of the property done, we've had to have title searches of the property done, and I think we're finally at a point where uh, we can get the final agreements in place on Rose Hill. So I mean, Rose Hill is still going as an as as a uh, a work product uh, for my office and John's office, and I and it, the closeout really has been done for about four years now. So I don't expect that over the next ten years that we're going to see really that we're going to see less work being done out there as far as maintenance of that facility. Uh, give you an idea as far as West Kingston. Costs on West Kingston right now are about $7.6 million was spent there. South Kingstown's cost will be about uh, $1.7 million uh, in terms of total cost. I'm expecting that uh, when we get all said and done, we'll spend a little under $2 million at Plains Road, and we'll spend just a little over $5 million as far as uh, uh, Rose Hill is concerned, and that's not without that's without the O and M. But when you get all said and done with it, when we get done with two Superfund sites that were closed out in South Kingstown, our effective cost toward the entire cost of those projects works out to be around 22 percent. So we're paying only 22 uh, cents on the dollar, and when the original Superfund notifications came in, uh, they were looking for. Uh, far greater than that. In fact, at that point, that uh, they wanted us to do the entire closeout. So I think we've done an effective job in terms of managing those sites and also uh, uh, curbing a major pollution potential within the community. However, the long-term costs are going to be there where we're looking at probably between uh, two fifty dollars and $300,000 a year each and every year, probably for the next 20 years. The reimbursement to the state will be on 27 years, but I think most of our costs, uh, uh, as far as maintenance and, and operation and testing, will be done over a 20-year period. So uh, I've tried to isolate those costs more this year than in the past. What we're showing is that any of the excess revenue within the transfer station operation uh, goes toward paying down the cost of the landfill maintenance and operation. Anything in excess of that that isn't available within our uh, retained earnings is going to have to come out of property taxes. So what I'm expecting is that uh, we will probably be looking at uh, a $200,000 property tax support requirement uh, in a future year, probably uh, within the next two to four years. But uh, we're still working on the numbers, uh, but. This is uh, really, I think, what we're going to see on a, on a reoccurring basis in that fund. Any questions? Yes, Polly? What do we see uh, after we've done all that and in 10 years? What can we do with that land? Well, as far as Rose Hill is concerned, uh, the front section really has little utility because of the crown that's there. If you recall, what we did is we removed all of the material from the back landfill and brought that out uh, out front and then we crowned the landfill. Uh, I don't think that there's a great deal of utility. We had done a land reuse uh, study on it and we really didn't come up with much that it could be used for. Yeah, uh, it was a beneficial reuse study. I think the only use that they, the consultant deemed potentially feasible was a golf learning center because it's a, a golf learning center oh yeah not a driving range because it's not but you know something for you know people who are just learning to try to where the ball doesn't carry too far unfortunately you can't even put up you know netting like you see at some driving range because you can't go into the cap so it would it really be just a golf learning center but that that was really we i think it's going to be vegetated and and and, and nothing else but the back section is a 20 acre parcel that exists right now that uh, is clean because the materials were removed. It backs up to the, uh, to the Saugatucket River, and it does have utility. Uh, and it could be used. We've looked at that, that it could be used for an active uh, uh, play space or for uh, some other type of municipal use. Uh, so that back acreage could, uh, could in fact, uh, uh, be used. I mean, at this point, we're looking at that as that may end up being uh, a uh, tree disposal area if we had a major hurricane. 
because we would have to have a place to be able to uh, have uh, debris staging. But at this point, uh, it could be used for other purposes. Uh, the problem with a, an outdoor recreational activity is that the uh, population of the seagulls from the transfer station uh, are affecting the area that could be a, a play field. Uh, so, I mean, you've got a great deal of problems uh, if you were going to have outdoor use there, uh, if there was going to be any type of a, uh, a managed turf environment. Any other questions? If not, uh, that concludes uh, the sections we were going to deal with this evening. Thank you, John. Um, and Steve, Allen, and Andy. And I would like to recognize Paul and Lou and Bernie and our audience tonight. Thank you for all of your work. And just for the record, I will ask if there's any public comments. Seeing none. Oh, sorry, Steve. I'm Steve. I live at uh, Plains Road in West Kingston. And I couldn't make it to the meeting last night, so I'm going to touch a little bit about yesterday. Um, before I say anything, I, I had to go to the planning department because uh, it's interested in the development going on at Old North Road. And I uh, just wanted to say that, again, people are very professional that I've talked to, and that just tells me that the money that we're spending in your budgets is being well spent. And uh, my concern that, that, you know, the other thing, I, being living on the Exeter, South Kingstown Line, my cable comes via... Exeter, so the only way I get to see a meeting is uh, via the internet. It's a good uh, service that you provide. Thank you. Uh, my concern about the budget, it sounds like uh, we're going to increase it. And uh, I work at a facility There's the, where I work, South County Post and Beam, New England Wood Products, Modine. Uh, we've all been working 24-hour uh, weeks. Modine, I know, is only working four days. Uh, in December, we, we had 16 employees, now we're down to 14. Three years ago, we had 26 employees. So when you raise my taxes, there's five of us that work at South County Post, we live in South Kingston. So when you raise my taxes, it's only a little bit, but you're really, you're raising my employers a lot more. And uh, you know, as I said before, it seems to me it's pretty silly to increase the, the school d district's budget, or the school committee's budget, when uh, the school superintendent has said herself that they can save 500000 to a $1 million by closing the school. And uh, there seems to be consensus on the school committee based on when I went to their meetings that they need to close the school. They just don't want to do it this year. And uh, to me, the idea of spending a half million to a $1 million to conduct a study to close a school is silly when we have a lot of time between now and next school year to decide what school to close. Nobody's going to like the decision to close any school. Nobody really wants that to happen, but that's reality. And, uh, you know, I was watching a, uh, you know, the stuff going on in Wisconsin, so I was watching on the news they had at our state capitol, people were supporting uh, uh, the unions out in Wisconsin, and one of the banners I couldn't believe was in the background said, tax the rich, you know, that's the solution. And I, think, I think the teachers need to understand in this community when they say that, that we're the ones South Kingston's a rich community. We're getting taxed. It's going to affect what we can pay, pay them. And, uh, uh, you know, we're being taxed in the fact that the state's giving us back less money. And it's not going to get prettier. Central Falls is uh, in trouble. It's funny to read about Providence. Balance is budget. But balance, my budget is balanced, but I've only borrowed $80 million to cover the expense. I mean, I don't see how that's legal. But anyway, in the end, this is the rich community. We're going to end up paying. Uh, the uh, other thing, just on tonight's thing, it's just, just a comment uh, about the, uh, uh, the dump at Rose Hill is... Uh, you know, South County Post and Beam, uh, we started taking our own garbage to the dump. So one of the things that I learned is, uh, you know, it costs five cents a pound to throw stuff away. 
And uh, I've also learned that if I take metal and I bring it to the uh, recycle place, at this time you, you get uh, 11 cents a pound for metal. So I always go and I say, well, you know, that's a difference of 16 cents if I take the metal out of the dumpster and I bring it in. That I save my company 5 cents and I make 11 cents. And uh, when I go to the dump, there's people throwing away washers, dryers, lawnmowers, and they're paying us to take that. It'd be nice if we could get some more of the revenue out of that. And uh, you said that there's a bunch of extra land in there. It'd be nice if maybe we could put out for bid for a place like Exeter Scrap Metal or somebody to uh, run a scrap metal facility out of that area. It'd be a private enterprise making some money in the area. But, but again, the big thing is uh, I really would like you guys to think hard about, yeah, it's only 1%. It's only $25 for the average household. But it all adds up, and you're talking about more increases with people's water usage fees, people's sewers, all that. It just keeps, keeps adding up. And uh, just thanks for listening to me. Thank you, Steve. Just one point I want to make. I would never recommend or support putting a scrap metal uh, on the closed landfill. At this point, you would never want metals on the ground close to the Saugatucket River. We've already got a uh, deficiency notice as far as the uh, water quality at that, uh, at that river. So that would be the wrong choice for, for that type of an application. Thank you. Any further questions from the audience? Any further questions here from the town council? Okay, which brings us to tomorrow night. Um, so, meeting adjourned. <laughs>